So I did not begin this by telling you my name. I'm Sonia Gant, and during the day, I have the opportunity to lead the CMS Foundation. It's the nonprofit partner of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. I grew up in this community. I was a graduate of CMS. I always say we are CMS family. My husband is a graduate of the district, and so are my two children. Um, I have uh, such, I really revere and appreciate this day as a time for us to reflect. And I'm thrilled about this panel because I do think it's important to always continue to tell our stories and especially the stories of those who really did some groundbreaking things. And so if you notice this panel discussion was called Groundbreakers, a panel of first. Um, so we're gonna share and hear their stories, but I hope that we didn't come today just to learn and hear from them but also to be inspired and motivated because the other theme of the Gantt for today is it takes a village. And so that means we all have a role to play in our communities. So if we leave here and we just learned a little something that was nice to know, um, that's only half of what we really should do. We should be motivated to work wherever, wherever our feet are each day. So without, that's enough for me, um, but I wanna share for you, and I think this is the first time in two years that we've had this many in-person celebrations for MLK Day, so it's nice to be back together. Now it's my honor to introduce to you our panelists, and I'm going to begin with Dorothy Count Scoggins. It was 65 years ago that she was one of four students who helped to integrate Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. I see quite a few young people here, and I know, you all remember how you get those jitters on the first day of school? Yeah, your parents know about it too. We get those jitters when we're going to first day on a job, first day of an assignment. For Dorothy Count Scoggins, when she was 15 years old, her walk into school, she walked into school not alone, but surrounded by a pretty angry mob that did not want her to be there at Harding High School. Um, that school now is called Irwin Avenue, but her entire walk to the door, um, she wasn't greeted in the way I hope that you're greeted today by teachers who are smiling and excited to see you there. But she took that walk for all of those who came after, and she was one of four. That picture of her walking into Harding High School not only made headlines right here in Charlotte, but across the country. Dorothy Count Scoggins then dedicated her career to education, especially early childhood education. So I welcome you officially today and thank you for the work, your courage then and really your ongoing advocacy for children in our community and their education. Thank you. <laughs> Seated to her right, Mr. James Ferguson. He co-founded the first integrated law firm here in the state of North Carolina. It's now known as Ferguson Chambers and Sumter. He is certainly passionate about making sure that our justice system works well for everyone. For many years, he focused on catastrophic injury, wrongful death, medical malpractice, and personal injury cases. And I have to say this, successfully resolving cases for injured plaintiffs in an aggregate amount of $100 million. However, one of his most well-known cases was his defense of the Wilmington 10. Nine men and one woman who were convicted of arson and conspiracy, but had been wrongly convicted. They served almost a decade before he won their release on appeal. He's been recognized by the National Law Journal as one of the nation's top 10 litigators and has been listed in every edition of the best lawyers in America in two categories, personal injury litigation and criminal defense. Mr. Ferguson co-founded South Africa's first trial advocacy program, taught trial advocacy in England as well as throughout the United States. And he's also achieved the distinction as a teacher of trial skills, having held teaching positions at Harvard Law School and North Carolina Central Law School. 
thank you, Mr. Ferguson, for being here and just for always your encouragement every time I would see you. I often share this brief story. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And when I was in high school, I interned at the firm and worked with the law clerks. And after one summer of doing a lot of work at the copy machine and reading, I realized that wasn't the type of writing I wanted to do. But there's a benefit in that. And I say to all the students, it's a good idea to try out what you think you're interested in. And I appreciate the opportunity that the firm afforded me. I think I might have, I might have gone on to law school and spent my parents' money and maybe come out and decided that really wasn't what I wanted to do. But a summer at the firm and the exposure was just invaluable to me. So thank you for being here. And finally, I'm delighted to welcome Ken Kuntz, Ken Kuntz and to say really a personal thank you to him. As a former news reporter and anchor in this city, I stand on his shoulders very directly. Ken Kuntz was the first African American to work in the newsroom at WBTV as a reporter and as an anchor. And I think it's interesting, you know, his interest in broadcasting was sparked in his hometown when he was in school in Beaumont, Texas, but his mom had Charlotte roots, so he decided he wanted to come to Johnson C. Smith for college. The fascinating thing I did not know until I was doing a little um, pre-work for our discussion today was that he majored in French. Oui. Yeah. <laughs> Still apparently knows a little bit. <laughs> that was it? Okay. He spent 14 years covering this community as a reporter and as an anchor, and during that time served a stint anchoring the morning news shows as well as, the we as a weekend anchor. He later became that station's director of community affairs and took on a number of projects in Charlotte. In 1995, though, he did something that I think was really brave at the time. He decided to test out his entrepreneurial spirit. And that was at a time you all are used to seeing live shots from across the country and around the world. And he decided to launch a business where he had a satellite truck uh, that ended up going across the country. People would rent it out from him. So I love the fact of seeing someone transfer from or making that move from being in front of the camera uh, to the business side of it as well. 2007, that entrepreneurial bug, he was bitten by it. So he launched a new venture called WENS TV, and that's an acronym for Webcast Events News Sports Televideo. It is a video production company. He says he's retired, but I see him out at quite a few things still working. Please join me in welcoming Ken Kuntz. So Ms. Count Scoggins, I think we want to begin with you um, because it is still, when I look at that photograph, and I want to ask, how many of you have seen the photograph of her wa walking into Harding? Good, most of you. If you have not seen it, you could probably pull out your phones right now and Google it and see that picture. But when I think about the jitters I always had the first day of school, the jitters my kids had, you were 15 at the time, and uh, when I look at all of those people surrounding you, and it's one thing to be surrounded by people who are encouraging you on, but when you're surrounded by people who are not wishing you well, I just want you, if you can, to take us back to what you were feeling that day and how you prepared for that walk. I guess a lot of it had to do with the conversation that I had with my parents before I left home that morning. Um, my father was a professor at the university, but my father was also a Presbyterian minister. And so the words of encouragement came from two aspects in terms of as a minister, but also as an educator. Uh, when we left that morning, his, one of his colleagues, Dr. Edwin Tompkins, came and he said, do you want me to do anything? He said, why don't you go with us? Uh, because I'm not sure what is going to happen once we get to, to, to the school. Uh, when, of course, when we got there uh, at the corner of uh, Fifth Street and, and see that leading into uh, Harding, that street had been barricaded. And so that's about a two-block walk to the auditorium where I was to enter. 
and uh, of course on the streets were lined with students as well as adults. And so Dad let me out, but I remember three things that he said to me, and I think this is what helped me to be able to get to the, do to the front door. One of the things he said is, you are inferior to, to no one. You can do anything that you want to do. Hold your head up and be proud of who you are. And so those were the things that I took with me as I made that two block walk. The comments that were made by the students, but also by the adults, I just continued to keep my eyes as I sit on the door to be able to get and hold my head up high as my father said and be proud of who I am. When um, there was a woman who had formed a white citizens council here in Charlotte, she was there and she was telling the students, don't let her get through that door. So a lot of the things that were going on she was provoking them, but the thing I guess to me that was most humiliating was that she told the girls to spit on her, and they did. And I tell people that famous dress I wore that day, my grandmother had made that dress for me. So it meant a lot to me, you know, so by the time I got to the auditorium to walk through the door, the spit was dripping from the bottom of my dress. But as I said, I had, there was a reason for me, me being there. And my re the reason for me being there was I deserved to have the same education that they did. And that's why I continued the walk to get inside. Mm. Mm. Thank you for your courage. Mr. Ferguson, co-founding the first integrated law firm in this state. Um, give us an idea of the reaction at the time when you all formed the firm, and also share a little bit about your desire to become an attorney, which I believe began um, when you became uh, very active in your community of Asheville. Well, let, let me start with my my interest in becoming an attorney, which actually started when I was in high school. And in Asheville, where I grew up, uh, we were like every other community in the South where everything was completely segregated. I remember as a child growing up in Asheville, uh, all of the positions of meaning were held by white people. Black people simply could not have a position that was meaningful uh, for working or whatever, uh, aside from being a teacher. And if, if, if one was a teacher, you knew you would be teaching uh, in, a, in a school that was an all-black school. So everything in Asheville uh, was divided between black and white. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, my children often kid me now that uh, when we would travel from Charlotte to, to Asheville when they were uh, probably the ages of some of these children sitting on the front row here, they thought that Asheville was an all-black city. Now bear in mind, at that time, Asheville was somewhere between 12 and 14 percent black, uh, so that it was overwhelmingly white. But when they went to, uh, to Asheville, uh, with, with uh, their mother and I, they would go to my parents' house, which was in an all-black neighborhood, to her parents' house across town, which was in an all-black neighborhood. So the only people that they saw were the black people in those neighborhoods. And for years, they thought that Asheville was all black. They know now that that's not true because Asheville, even now, I think is about 12 or 13% black and the black community is diminishing. But it was a society where everything was de uh, defined in terms of black or white. But sometimes uh, in, in my teenage years when I was in high school in Asheville, uh, while Dot was going through her 
uh, bravery and turmoil at the same time here uh, in Charlotte. I got involved in the sit-in movement, as it came to be known, in 1960, in February of 1960. Uh, Frank McCain, who uh, lived here until a few years ago when he passed away, and uh, Ezell Blair and three other blacks in Greensboro decided that that it made no sense for them not to be able to go into a lunch counter and get a hamburger or a soda. Uh, so they uh, started what became to known came to be known as the sit-in movement, and that spread like wildfire across college campuses throughout the South. In Asheville, where I was a, a high school teenager at the time, uh, there was no black college, so the fire that caught caught on black colleges throughout the South didn't happen in Asheville. But there were some of us in high school who felt that we had as much a right to sit and buy a hamburger at a lunch counter as anybody else did. So we organized ourselves, and as far as I know, we were the, the first and only high school group that organized to do sit-ins. But in any event, we, uh, we organized to do sit-ins and to, to get ready, some of our adult advisors uh, 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 told us uh, we needed to learn the nonviolent method. And so we studied nonviolence. We studied Gandhi. We studied Dr. King to find out what we needed to do and to find out what bravery it took to do nonviolence, uh, which was even greater than the bravery it took to do violence, which actually took no, no real bravery at all. But in any event, in preparing to do nonviolent sit-ins if we needed to, we were fortunate to be able to meet with the sole black lawyer in Asheville at that time in 1960, a man named Reuben Daly. And Mr. Daly came to meet with us, and we wanted to find out from him all of the le legalities that we needed to know about in doing something that had not been done before, and this and that and whatnot. So we expected to get a long, detailed lecture from Mr. Daly uh, about what the law required and what you needed to be careful of and how you needed to make sure you did this, that, and the other. And instead of getting the, the, the long, erudite lecture we expected, Mr. Daly said, you all do what you have to do. And if you need me, call me. I'll be there to help you. That was his lecture. <laughs> but we heard him, so we said, we'll do what we needed to do. And in, at, at that time, uh, we organized ourselves to do what we heard they had done in Greensboro, and that was to go sit in at a lunch counter and not get served and turned away and to refuse to go and be dragged away for the police and uh, be locked up. And we expected the whole nine yards of what happens when you engage in passive resistance. But as it turned out, Asheville, though we, we integrated the, the, the public uh, facilities there, Asheville never had a sit-in. That was because there was uh, some adult advisors of ours who themselves had studied the nonviolent movement. And they encouraged us to contact some white people in the community to see if they would uh, join with us in doing uh, what we thought was going to be the protest movement. But we also learned that there were certain steps in the nonviolent process. I mean, number one, you identify the problem. And number two, you try to resolve the problem if you can through negotiation. So we negotiated with the uh, lunch counter managers and the store owners of four establishments in Asheville. And to our surprise, the store managers actually agreed with us that we would work out a scheme whereby they would serve us. Uh, so we did, and there were some white uh, adults in the community who agreed to meet us 
And so we met them. The store managers had already agreed to serve them and us, and they did. So we accomplished what was not accomplished in a lot of other places. We desegregated the lunch counters without, get a, uh, without getting arrested. I'll never forget the taste of that hamburger and that soda that day. <laughs> and the relief I felt at knowing I wasn't going to jail. <laughs> so all of that worked out, and we were able to desegregate uh, the lunch counters in Asheville is where we started. And then we went from there to desegregate all of Asheville. And we did that as teenagers. And I say, I, I, I want to emphasize that because number one, we had no idea what we were doing when we decided to do it. But we knew we had to do it. We felt like it was the thing to, to get done. And we took that step and we had people in the community, black and white, who supported us in doing that. So when I hear people today discounting young people, when we see young people protesting and trying to make a difference in their community, I always say to myself, there I was when I was that age, a teenager, trying to do the same thing. And the more we think about it, we realize that young people move us to do things that sometimes we otherwise would not do. So today, when I hear that young people are doing something, and I can see that it's something that's likely to lead to something uh, helpful to the community and where it's, it, 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 it seems to be positive, I say let's support the young people. Now to get back to what I started to tell you about, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we uh, met with the lawyer and he said do what you need to do and I'll be there to assist you, it was then that I decided I wanted to be in a position like that lawyer there where I could do something to help my community. And that's when I first determined that I wanted to go into law. And uh, as a high school student then, I knew that that was what I wanted to do. So I finished high school. I went to North Carolina Central. I left North Carolina Central. I went to Columbia Law School. Uh, I got out in 1967, I think it was. And it was in 1967 that I had gone to law school. I knew I wanted to come back to, to, to the South to practice law, but I didn't quite know how I was going to do it. And as fate would have it, as I approached the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York one day to see if there was a way they could assist me in practicing law in the South, it just so happened that there was a person there that I had never met before who was already doing what I wanted and that was my, one of my greatest friends and, 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 and a great mentor to me, a young lawyer at that time whose name was Julius Chambers, happened to be at the Legal Defense Fund office in New York the very day I went there. He didn't know I was going to be there. I didn't know he was going to be there. But we met, and we clicked. Uh, Jack Greenberg was over at LDF at the time, introduced us. And Chambers, uh, who had always been here in Houston, uh, greeted me by saying, uh, how you doing? What's your name? <laughs> and after I trembled a little bit, I got my name out. <laughs> he said, oh, well, what are you doing down here? What are you going to do? I said, well, I came down here to see if I could come back to North Carolina and do civil rights practice, and I thought the legal defense fund could help me do that. And he said, well, they probably could, but let me tell you something. I'm already doing that in North Carolina, <laughs> and I need some help. Why don't you think about coming and joining me? And I'm thinking, is this man crazy? <laughs> we just met. He doesn't know anything about me. I know about him because I'd already heard about him. Uh, but it was like that that he extended to me an opportunity to come to North Carolina. So we agreed. At, at his invitation, I agreed, I should say, that I would come down during spring break, spend that spring break with him and his wife, uh, and we'd see where it went from there. And I did. And I came down, and uh, he graciously agreed to offer me uh, accommodations at his house, stayed at his house, met his family, met his wife. They treated me loyal. They treated me like they had known me all my life, and they just liked me. And at the 
end of, and I follow trends around here too. That was basically all I did for the three or four days I was here. And I didn't know why I was doing all of this, but I did. Glad I did. Because at the end of that time, without <coughs> having done any background check on me, without even looking at my law school grades, he didn't require a transcript, never asked for a single reference. So he was basically extending to me, a stranger, the opportunity of my lifetime. And although I was a, a, a crazy young man at the time, I knew better than to not do that. So I said, yes, I will come join you. And it was that simple uh, at that time. And actually, at that time, neither of of, uh, neither Chambers nor I, nor uh, our two white cohorts, Adam Stein or Jim Lanning, knew what we were doing at the time. But at the end of a year, Chambers had the idea of forming this racially integrated law firm uh, with Adam Stein, Jim Lanning, uh, two young white lawyers who wanted to do something community-wide helpful, and Chambers, who was a young lawyer at that and myself, uh, who had no idea what I was getting into with the felt boot until I said okay. And we formed uh, the first racially integrated law firm in North Carolina, and that was just back in 1967. And we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't know where we were going, but we were fortunate because there was no one else in the community doing civil rights advocacy group to the extent that we were going to do. We had lots of support in the community. Other black lawyers wanted to join with us to do what we had to do. And the fact of the matter was there was little or no help for black people who wanted to make a difference in their lives and the lives of the, of the community uh, at that time. So we walked into a vacuum and we helped to fill that vacuum and we were able to make some differences in Charlotte. Uh, and I, I guess one of the best known cases of our law firm was the school desegregation case that we did uh, in 1968, uh, I think it was. Now bear in mind, it was 1954 that the United States Supreme Court had said no more segregated schools in the United States. And this was 1968, what is that, 14 years after the Supreme Court decision came? We were having to do in 1968 what the Supreme Court had ordered to be done in, in 1954, 14 years later. And that lets you know a little bit about what the civil rights struggle has been about. Nobody rushed to desegregate schools. Nobody rushed to change what Dorothy Counts ha had meant when she tried to go to school in 1957. The only good thing that came out of that that I know of is that as a result of her being heckled and driven away from the Charlotte schools, uh, being driven away from the Charlotte schools, is that she wound up coming to Asheville to go to a school called Allen High School. I was in high school at the time. And uh, I will confess to you now that as a high school student, I spent a lot of time <laughs> trying to get to know the girls at Allen High School because <laughs> it was all for girls. <laughs> and Mr. one of the Ferguson. most beautiful people I met at that time was Dorothy, Dorothy Counts. Counts. And we've had a wonderful friendship <laughs> yeah. since that time. So do I benefited from her trouble. Do you uh, know what strikes me about your story? Two things. Um, number one, representation matters. So the black attorney that you went to in Asheville, that, that um, his acceptance and his conveying to you how he would be there to help you certainly made a difference. And the other thing is the meeting of you and Mr. Chambers, how um, sometimes you're not thinking about the significance of your act and what it's going to mean, but you're reacting out of the moment. He sensed something in you that he didn't need to see references or see your grades. He knew the work that you wanted to do, and he wanted 
the two of you to work together because he saw the common mission there. You mentioned 1968. I want to bring Ken Kuntz into this conversation and think about 1969. For all of us here, it's not a big deal to turn on the news at night and see persons of color either reporting the news or anchoring the news. It's very commonplace, but it was not in 1969. And I want you, if you can, Mr. Kuntz, to take us back into what it was like to be in a newsroom at the time and the importance of bringing a different perspective and what had really been missing in our local news coverage. Okay. Ah. When you get old as I am, you sit down too long, you have more difficulty getting <laughs> up, so I'm gonna stand up. First of all, thanks for involving me and inviting me to be a part of this. Now, I have been a journalist. Unlike these two, they were on the front lines. And I consider myself a chronicler of the times. And that chronicling of the times goes all the way back to middle school, Northwest Junior High School, I believe, where Dorothy and my two older sisters were classmates. And my aunt was a teacher. And she later had a son named Bob Tyson, who was among the first at W. SOC TV, however we beat him at WBTV. <laughs> and um, for Fergie, it goes back to, again, Chambers, Stein, Ferguson, and Lanning, uh, when they were the integrated, first integrated law firm in the South. As a matter of fact, I remember for the 25th anniversary, uh, I had approached uh, the firm about doing a very significant 25th anniversary of their law firm. and. I think my proposal said, Jim, we were going to get Oprah Winfrey to come down here and, <laughs> and be a part of this grand celebration. And none of that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, let me just tell you about how I came to be in this business. And I've always considered myself, as I said, a chronicler of the times. Jim mentioned 1954. In 1954, I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, but in 1955, my family had relocated to a little town called Robstown, Texas. Anybody know where Corpus Christi is? Corpus Christi is 16 miles east of Robstown on Highway 77. In 1954, after that Supreme Court ruling in 1955, the Nueces County School Board decided we are no longer sending kids from Phyllis Wheatley Elementary School after the eighth grade to Corpus Christi to Solomon Coles High School. We are going to accept them to come to Robstown High School, where the school name was the Cotton Pickers. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. You know something about cotton pickers, don't you? Your grandmama knew them? All right. Robstown Cotton Pickers, and contrary to what some of you might think, the town's cotton picker logo was a cotton bowl because we were in the dead center of the Texas Cotton Belt. In 1955, when the school system decided to desegregate Robstown High School, the black kids no longer were bused to Solomon Coles. My dad at the time had been the principal of Phyllis Wheatley Elementary School since 1950. In 1938, he had been run out of a little town called Union Hope, Texas, outside Palestine, because he had the audacity to ask that white school board for new school buses for the black kids in the county who had to walk to school and be rocked and thrown at and cursed at spat at by the white kids as they rode by on their buses to their schools. Nonetheless, my dad never gave up. He ultimately came to Charlotte in the mid-40s, taught a year at West Charlotte High School, 44, 45, and subsequently met this woman in Charlotte. Now, they married December 31st, 1947. I was born September 22nd, 1948. Now, if any of you know the name Reverend Dr. J.B. Humphrey, pastor at First Baptist Church, which is now First Baptist West, 
um, that's the pastor who married my mother and father. And my dad, having moved back to Texas and had a job out there, uh, went back. My mother had gone back to Second Ward High School to finish her education there and subsequently graduated in May 1948, five months pregnant with me. And as my dad would say, I was a honeymoon conception, but a Texas born. And she went on out to join him in Texas. Fast forward, my dad in 1950 takes this job as the principal of Phyllis Wheatley Elementary School. In 1955, the black kids that were formerly bused to Corpus Christi were now accepted totally without incident at Robstown High School. Now, why do I say totally without incident? Because over time, I began to realize that the greater the population of black folks, the more interesting the circumstances got. Now, Robstown and Corpus Christi had a population, Robstown was about 10,000 people. We had probably four, 400 black people in the town. So there was no real reason that they would have to expect that there was going to be any major uh, conflict in dealing with us. It's because they certainly outnumbered us. But from 1950 to 1954, my dad was the principal of a segregated school. In 1955, it was totally open to the black kids and without incident. And we moved away from there in 1961. And with an old friend of mine, Malachi Green, blessed his soul, rested in peace, he later became a <laughs> Charlotte City Councilman here. And he used to brag about how he was among the first blacks at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hell, he could, only, he could sing their, their uh, school song, and he proudly did that. And I would get his goat by telling him, man, while well, y'all was up there begging them white folks, let y'all go to their schools and stuff, we've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would boldly sing the Carolina loyalty song. He never finished Carolina. He finished Livingstone College. And what I used to go to him about was, how dare you know the Carolina school song and you talk about how bad they treated you, but you came back home to get your degree and you don't even know their school song. So that was one of the things that I kept jugging guys about. But it was 1961 that my dad took a job outside the integrated or desegregated uh, Nueces County to Liberty County, Texas. Now that's on Highway 90 then before I-10, uh, halfway between Houston and Beaumont. That was my first circumstance in a segregated school since I left Charlotte after the second grade to return to Texas to my dad's school. Now you say, left Charlotte? Yep. I attended Isabella White Elementary School, which is where the stadium in part now stands. Where my grandmother lived, and I spent a lot of my time, is where the Carolina Panthers practice field is now. In my phone, I have pictures of that. So I have had this broad experience of both white folks who accepted you and white folks who hated you. And my experience when we moved to Raywood was the first experience that I had of open segregation. And um, it was in what was called a really Creole Cajun community where there were some black folk who looked a lot like some of you white folks in here today. And they in turn sometimes would actually on the weekends pass for white. They were primarily Catholic, we were Baptists. The principal there told my dad, who was a very dark-skinned belt about the complexion of David Taylor's uh, shirt there, uh, said, Kuntz, uh, if you convert, convert to Catholicism, you probably have a better chance of longevity here. And my dad, a staunch Baptist, said, I don't think so. And two years later, we left Raywood, Texas, to Beaumont, Texas, my ninth grade year in high school, where I spent my high school years, the first two of them, in a segregated Hebert High School, but later 
when freedom of choice was presented, um, some of the kids, black kids, and some of the guys in particular who couldn't make our teams went across the track to the white folks' school, and <laughs> one of them in particular became an all-state <laughs> football player, track, and basketball. But he couldn't make our team, not because of his skill, but because of the coaching didn't really recognize true talent. And that's probably why I sat on the bench a long time myself. <laughs> but I couldn't leave the school where my dad's bread was buttered. But nonetheless, some spring of 69, how I got here, I met then Johnson C. Smith University President, Dr. Lionel Newsom, at our National Alpha Phi Alpha Convention in Houston, Texas, and expressed my concern to leave Lamar University where I had gone for my first two years. And that's where I was in 1968 when Dr. King uh, was assassinated. And that's where I was when we had some campus unrest, and I decided I could not tolerate the PWI, that's a new term now, predominantly white institution that was not accepting us as we had become to accept them. So I inquired about my scholarship to Smith at our national convention. He said, son, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll let you know. That was uh, uh, July. 1969, and I expected probably a week or two he'd send me one of them sorry Charlie letters or dear John letters, it's over. But I got a phone call from Dr. Newsom saying that we don't have a scholarship for you, but you've expressed some interest in media, and uh, I think we can find a job for you at a local radio or TV station, and if not, you can get work study in the public relations office where my son-in-law is the head of PR for the school. My dad was away in some studies out of Arizona State, and my mother and I said, well, as soon as your dad comes home, we'll sit down and talk about it. Well, she knew that in 1968 that Lamar University had had some considerable student unrest, and I was not gonna be a part of resistance that uh, they seemed to want to uh, afford us. So Dr. Newsom said, son, we might have an opportunity for you at Johnson C. Smith. Now you say you're interested in media. I had started writing for our campus uh, school newspaper uh, my junior year and uh, left the football team my senior year to go into the booth and become a play-by-play -play uh, color commentator for the local black radio station that covered the football games. We happened to win the last black league state for a football championship that year. Not that I contributed because I quit, <laughs> but none, nonetheless, I came to Charlotte in 1969 and interviewed at WBTV News, and uh, they virtually hired me on the spot, and I started working there as a uh, news reporter. So since September of 1969, having seen much of Charlotte change, uh, I consider myself a chronicler of the times. So I have seen, and as I have observed, yes, Charlotte has done well. Her dad, Harvey Gant, in I think his first term, appointed me to the Charlotte Uptown Development Corporation Board, which was headed by some of the major corporate leadership at that time, including Hugh McCall, Rolf Neal, Bill Lee. Bill Lee was president of Duke, Rolf Neal, publisher of the Observer, and of course, Hugh McCall, whom everybody knows. And uh, I said, why the hell are you putting me on the board with people like that? I don't make that kind of money. I don't have that kind of influence. He says, we need media representation, and I think you can do what we need done. And I accepted it, and I served a term on the Uptown Development Corporation board mm -hmm. and uh, continued to do what I call chronicle the events and happenings of Charlotte, including the video I still have of your dad's <laughs> swearing in <laughs> ceremony at Owens Auditorium. But I won't talk much longer, but I will tell you that I have observed Charlotte from the 330-some thousand people when I came with a 32% black uh, presence here to now 1.3 million people and about a 28% black representation. I was at the MLK uh, breakfast this morning uh, and somewhat disappointed, uh, not with the celebration, but with what I have observed over the years here, and that is Charlotte, in spite of all of its growth and development, 
we're still asking for, politicking for, campaigning for, asking for, and begging for equality, representation, fairness. And we're still not where we should be yet. And for those of you who know about Texas politics, Texas politics back then wasn't the same as Texas politics are now. So that's why we were able to, shall I say, assimilate, melt into the general population without incident. But right now, Texas is even trying to take out the whole idea that slavery ever even existed and a whole lot of other things that have kind of infested yes. a large part of this country. Mr. So Coontz, so I'm we're glad. going to let you. Yeah. I yeah, love journalists because we like to tell you all the details at yeah. one time. I'm not going to tell you any more details <laughs> unless you ask me. But I want to I want to ask all of you, um, just at the time, did you appreciate the significance of what you were doing? And so, Ms. Count Scoggins, I think about it, you were just going to high school. It might not have been at the forefront of your mind how that experience was going to impact the rest of your life. Well, Sonny, I guess in a way, yes, uh, I did. And a lot of it had to do with conversations as a child growing up and a family, not only with my parents, but also my grandparents, the importance of making a difference. Um, one of the things they always said is, you know, you need to give back, even though I grew up in a segregated environment <laughs> uh, back then. But my parents also stressed the importance of acceptance of other people. So I didn't grow up with a warped, uh, I guess, in terms of thinking in terms of the fact that and the differences, I mean, I saw them. I mean, I went to visit my grandparents, and of course, in the town that they lived in, they were Native, Amer uh, Native American Indians, as well as white, as well as black. So I experienced that in that community when I visited my grandparents during the summer. And living in Charlotte, you know, as I talked to a group of students on Friday at third graders at Clear Creek uh, Elementary School, and I said to them, you know, they, the questions they ask about what's the difference when you were in the third grade, our age, and what's the difference now? And I told them, I said, but one thing, the difference is, is I look across this group of students, but I see the diversity in terms of what uh, exists in our school system at this particular school. But when I grew up in Charlotte, of course, there was black and white, and that was it. And I lived, in, I lived on the campus of Johnson C. Smith University and a surrounding that university, which there's a lot of history there, you know, basically like was a black community. But one block over, on Tucker CJ and going back through Seversville, that was a white community. But at the same time, we didn't mix. Mm -hmm. So going back to answering your question, I guess for me, you know, it made an impact on my life because what happened to me at Harding, I then said at 15, what happened to me, I would make sure it didn't happen to another child. So what it did for me is as a career for me, as Sonia told you that I was in early childhood education, I worked in that field for 40 years, but I said it starts at birth. As children come into this world, these children don't know prejudice. It's taught. So it's my role to make sure that these children, as they come into this world, they understand that yes, there are differences, but they have to learn, they need to learn to accept each other. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it, the impact it made on me was the choice that I chose as a career in terms of doing what I do, what I did, what I continue to do at my age now to make sure that every child, and as I said to you earlier, I think we've gotten to the place where, where we live in a very selfish world. It's not about you and yours. And I always say, it's not just you, yours, and mine. It's about all of us. Mm -hmm. So the work that I do has to do with every single child. 
regardless where they come from, regardless where they look like, that it's my role to make sure that every child gets the same quality education in this community. Mr. Mr. Ferguson, I, I've heard you often talk about the importance of community as well. And I know that your colleagues have often um, lauded you for the fact that you didn't always, um, you weren't concerned necessarily about the challenge a case presented, but being guided by the importance of taking on the case. Um, and I'd like you just to share a little bit as you, um, there is a question here as I'm forming it in my mind, but it strikes me community was always at the forefront, whether or not it was the right thing to do, not about whether it was winnable. Um, and also the idea that while you may have been the first integrated firm, you didn't, there was important work to do. It wasn't necessarily about the firm that you formed, but the collaboration and the working with community overall. There was a question in there somewhere. Hopefully you've. <laughs> well, I, I think you raised, raised a number of questions. And one is uh, the question of, of motivation. Uh, why we do what we do. Um, <clears throat> and we don't always know. It's not like we sit down and, and, and decide one day where we're going to wind up 30, 40, 50 years later. But you see a problem. And you do what you can at that time, at that moment, in that circumstance to make change. For example, when I was in high school and some colleagues and friends of mine uh, got together with me and we decided we wanted to, uh, to make Asheville a part of the sit-in movement too. We didn't know really what that meant, but we knew that that was something that needed to be done at that time. I didn't know at that time that I was gonna meet a black lawyer because I'd never one, met one in my life before. And that through that black lawyer's example, I would be inspired uh, to become a lawyer myself and become dedicated to trying to do something to make a difference. So we don't know uh, where our decisions will take us but what we do know is when there is an opportunity and we take that opportunity, that we have done the right thing. You don't always know what the end result is going to be, uh, but you know that there is something that needs to be done now. It's here, it's in front of me, I can do something now, and I do it, and you do that, and you hope for the best. And everything you do that's positive, for yourself, positive for the community, you somewhere in the back of your mind, you know that it's going to take you to a place that you need to be in that you haven't been before, and you hope for the best. And sometimes you get it, but sometimes you don't. Yeah. Mr. Kuntz, in the chronicling of this city's history and bringing a different perspective into a newsroom that was not there before. Um, how were your story ideas received? How were you received when you went into places where they weren't used to seeing uh, someone of color holding the microphone and crafting the story? Share a little of that with us. Well, I came into an environment of truly professional uh, journalists. Um, at the time, in 1969, had just been issued the Kerner Commission, which in short stated that America was a dual country, one black and one white. And for the Kerner Commission and news media, it said, so is our newsroom. And it was to that point that they started, and this was headed by CBS, the mission to desegregate schools. I'm um, not schools, but Newsrooms. Mm -hmm. I happened to be in that first wave of people and the only one here in Charlotte at that time. And um, for me, um, the professionals that I worked with, a standard had already been set 
and I just simply, a novice, never having been in a television newsroom before except in Beaumont to see Ella Mae Clampett from uh, one year on a promotional tour, they took me under their wings, and wherever I went, I represented WBTV. Only one instance was there that I recall that there was a so-called threatening of my presence, and there was a reporter at the Charlotte Observer named Susan Jatan. She and I were covering a Sunday afternoon uh, rally at the federal courthouse where Judge James McMillan had issued the court-ordered busing. And there was this about 6'4", 250 white guy and his wife and kids. They walked over to our conversation and he looked me dead in the eye and said to me, Charlotte is a real hornet's nest. And we proved that to one king and now we're going to prove it to another king. King James, and he was talking about James McMillan. My reporter friends who were all white looked at me because his inquiry was targeted to me. And I just simply looked at him and simply stated, I guess we will see. And I turned and we walked away. But I never felt any kind of um, fear for what I was doing because I knew whatever I was doing represented WBTV. I wasn't representing Ken Koontz. I represented the standards that had been set before me during my tenure and that would follow me. And most of those guys and the two women who were in our newsroom at the time uh, embraced me so warmly. And my station was a very conservative station and who would daily uh, issue these editorials that were contrary to overall Census, consensus in regards to desegregation. WSOC, on the other hand, was considered a more liberal station. But we just beat them to the punch and putting uh, me on the air before they were able to do it again because I was not the first in the Charlotte market. It was a guy named Bob Nicholas at Channel 9. And Bob Nicholas was only on the air about four months before Houston Station snapped him up. And that was four months before I came and decided this is where I'm gonna stay. So I never felt any kind of intimidation except for that one instance. That's good to hear, good to hear. I wanna begin to open it up and ask if there are any questions. I know sometimes, especially if you hadn't had a chance to write it down, um, it's hard to hold one. I see the young man in the back, yes. I think we do have some people with microphones and they may move around, but if you'd like to um, go ahead and ask your question, I'll repeat it for you just so everyone can hear. Sign out. Yes. Um, this is my neighbor. <laughs> uh, um, I have had conversation. I had had a conversation with one of the students from Harding fifty years after that. And when I say this, he said to me, and I said to him what you did and what was done to me at Harding was what you were taught. And yes, he admitted that his parents said to him the things that he had been taught as a child growing up 
and his father was a police officer here in Charlotte Mecklenburg. So yes, they knew what they were doing. They were doing, and they were under the direction of adults who also, and I said to him, I said, you were a, a youngster the same as I was, but you were following the directions of the adults that taught you that what I was doing was wrong. That man, when I say what I was doing was wrong, meaning that we were not supposed to be in the same room together. And he admitted that. So to answer your question, yes. I think a lot of them knew, because that's what they had been taught over the years, Winston. I think that, you know, whites were taught that they were superior. That's what my father said to me that morning. You are not inferior. You are not inferior to anyone. But we got that information from our peers, from our relatives, from our ancestors in terms of, but they were taught that we were inferior and therefore we did not belong there where we were. Gentleman right here in the front. Oh, I'm sorry. If you could hold on just a second, there's a gentleman in the back. Yes. Tommy Robinson, what kind of progress do you think we have made over the years? Because I was a part of the civil rights movement and I don't see that much change. The question was, what kind of progress do you feel we've made since the civil rights movement? Because he doesn't believe he has seen any change. Well, it, uh, the, there are two answers, I think, to that question. Uh, on one level, uh, when you look at it historically, we've not made much change, if any at all, because we still have today a lot of activity that uh, is based upon the premise that uh, whites are more entitled to the things that society has to offer than African-Americans are. So at that level, it, it seems like there's not much progress. But then, as my wife used to say when before she passed a few months ago, uh, whenever something would happen that indicated that there was some racial discrimination associated with it, uh, she would resolve it ultimately by saying, well, we're not still on the slave ship. <laughs> and and she, she was right about that. It, it wasn't as bad as it used to be. And if you think historically about it, you think about uh, our African-American ancestors in Africa, when they were out taking a walk in the sunshine one day and they wound up on a slave ship, not knowing where they were going, sailing for, for months on the ocean, uh, crowded like sardines on a slave ship where everything was done wherever you are, you, you ate, you went to the bathroom, you got sick, you threw up, but you stayed where you are for months. It's hard to imagine anyone undergoing that. So when we look at that, then we have to say, well, we're not on the slave ship anymore. And we are in a country where we are beginning uh, to make progress. Few people think about the Constitution of the United States when, when, when it, uh, uh, at its inception, uh, <coughs> women were not included. American Native Americans were not included. African Americans were not included. Poor white people were not included. Poor black people were not included. So when you go down the list of people who were left out of the Constitution, you wind up with a Constitution that was drawn uh, and created for a small group of white men. <laughs> and that was white men who were generally wealthy white men landowners, uh, and everybody else was I excluded at that time. Uh, but now, over 200 years later, we look at, a, at the Constitution and we think everybody was included, and even if they weren't at the time, they should be 
included. So it all depends on the perspective one takes. In, in, in one sense, in the sense that there is still racism rampant still in our society, we haven't made the progress that we had hoped for in eliminating white racism. It still happens, although we've made a lot of progress in that regard. But in terms of according rights, uh, the, uh, at the time the Constitution was initially adopted, uh, there was no intention in the Constitution that we would one day be relying upon the Constitution to guarantee equality of men and women, to guarantee equality of African Americans and white Americans. So in that sense, we've had a Constitution that has expanded to include much of what was excluded before. And in that sense, we have made progress. No one thought 200 years ago that little black children and little white children would be going to school together and would be playing in the park together and doing all the things they do together. So we have to keep in mind where we are in order to realistically understand uh, where we were in order to realistically understand where we are. So the answer to the question is yes, we have made some progress. The answer is also no. We have not made the progress that we hoped we would have by now. Mr. Coons, you wanted to weigh in on this? Yeah, one? I'd say, uh, as Fergus suggested, yes, we've made some progress. We've made a lot of progress. And in some other areas, we have made such regression of things, and a lot of it has, at its core, socioeconomic foundations. One of the things, as the gentleman that asked the question stated in a conversation a few years ago, you know, to a large extent, many black folk consider themselves and measure themselves successful by how far away from other black folk and into the white environment they can find themselves. And the old adage about it takes a village to raise a child, the village that this demographic grew up in was tremendously successful in a lot of the things they did against all odds. College education, when we came along, and school dropouts, uh, literacy. I would argue that we were at a much higher level then than we are now, in part because the best of the village, many of them left the village to emulate what they perceive to be the white man's water is wetter, his ice is colder, and that's the, the way they measure success in many instances. Not all of them, but when we do that, it's well known that our uh, median income tends to be 50 to 80% of what our white counterparts are. But yet we take our 80% and want to emulate their 100% and then wonder why our kids are in certain circumstances, why homes are in total disarray. I think we're probably maybe even below 50% now in terms of two-parent homes. Were we successful before with the dual parent homes, I would argue we, we really probably were. But we have a whole lot of things when we look in the mirror. Can you look back at yourself and say, what did I do to contribute to this still disparity in fairness and equality? And too often, when we look in that mirror, we may likely find that we came up way short because we chose to emulate our oppressors. Ms. Count Scoggins, did you want to weigh in on this one? No, okay. There's a gentleman here with a white sweater, yes. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I need to say this. I am old enough, uh, having been born and grown up in Charlotte, to have been touched by all three of these people, uh, without going to a lot of specifics, 
Uh, I will say that Mr. Kuntz is one of my best friends, uh, and as you hear him speak, you understand why. Uh, Mr. Ferguson said something to me in a college classroom at UNCC that still resonates with me to this day. Ms. Scoggins, I'm holding a picture of you and my daughter in my phone right now uh, where she met you was very impressed. My question is speci specifically for you, Ms. Ms. Scoggins. About four or five years after your terrible uh, experience at Harding High School, the city of Charlotte decided to give Harden High School to black kids as Irwin Avenue Junior High School. Yes. No, it was Irwin Avenue Junior High School at the time. I went there as an eighth grader. Uh, too young to understand the significance of it until I got to be an adult and really didn't think about it until the last few years, the irony of you being spat upon to walk through those doors and no more than five years later to have that school given to us uh, uh, as our school because Harding was getting a new high school. So my question to you was, were you aware of that at the time and if you were, how did that resonate with you that the city would turn around uh, and literally support you or not being allowed into Harding High School and then giving it to black kids no more than five years later? Uh, to answer your question, no, I was not aware of that five years. When I, when I left Harding, uh, of course, I moved to Pennsylvania and lived with my aunts to finish out, my aunt and uncle to finish out that school year. And as Fergie said, you know, I went to Asheville. I was in a boarding school there for my last two years of high school. And then came back to Johnson C. Smith and graduated in 1964. Uh, when I graduated from Johnson C. Smith in 64, then I moved on to New York. And I lived in New York until the late 60s and came back here in 68, 69 is when I came back to Charlotte. Um, in reference to your question, <laughs> you know, no, I was not a, aware that it was, you know, I always saw it as Irwin Middle School, uh, elementary school. Um, you know, I do know uh, that there is some significance there. I guess a piece there uh, last week, and I was talking to one of the reporters, and I was telling them that, um, there is some steel history there at Irwin Avenue um, from that day that they wanted to tear down. But because of a very uh, good friend of, of our family, uh, who's an architect here in Charlotte, who did the work of restoring Irwin Avenue, uh, that he fought to keep the steps. So a lot of people don't, are not aware that the steps going up to the entrance, going into the lobby, those steps actually led into the auditorium. And the auditorium, of course, you know, was taken away because it was a high school, and now it's elementary or middle school. But he did fight to keep those steps. So when I go there, and I've been there several times, I always feel that there is a connection there for me because of those steps are still there as a reminder uh, of um, that these are the steps that I walked up that morning and the days after to try to be able to do the right thing to ensure that. Um, and I always say my theme is um, to change the education system, not only in this community, but hopefully to change this education system in this country. And so I um, <laughs> hope that gives you some idea. Right. Thank you. We have a question in the back, in the back row. Yes. How you doing, Mr. Ken? It's good to see you again. <laughs> That's one of the young men that gives me new life. <laughs> he's, a, 
He's a regular out at archiving. Hey, young man. Yes, sir. This is, a, this is actually a question that I have for you. So you had said that you are a, a chronicler of the time, so I'm sure that you've seen the different trends that Charlotte has had in our communities to be able to struggle for our freedom and dignity. Um, and you also said that there's kind of been a devolvement of our community. We really seem to be alienated from each other. And now we're in a different situation than we were in the past where we're trying to resist a lot of our neighborhoods taking over. You know, um, Sugar Creek doesn't look the same as it used to. North Tryon doesn't look the same as it used to. Beatty's Ford doesn't look the same as it used to. You know, I remember, look, at, uh, you know, we were looking through those pictures and you were talking about how so many of these areas, you know, we were able to own and that really gave us a good foundation to even have community. So as, you know, younger, as a, as a young person who is trying to organize within the community, um, what is your advice to be able to rebuild these connections that we have with each other? And before I you know, finish my question, I'll let you answer. I also just wanna say that I'm very honored to be in y'all presence. You know, we, we wouldn't be where we are without the leaps and bounds and courage that y'all made. So thank you very much. By the way, how, how much you say you're gonna give me for that question? <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned that um, Archive has given me new life. For those of you who don't know, Archive is a coffee shop, black owned by a young 30 year old, 33 year old black female now. Never went to college, had her first child at 15. By the time she was 19, she had uh, had three children, married twice, and felt very insecure about who she was and what she was, though she was raised by a strong family that taught her the values. And it was a good Christian ethic family that she still retains today. And when I say that place gives me life, is because young people like him come there with a drive to be successful, entrepreneurs, questioners, community activists, and they have taken up the mantle. So when you hear folks talk about our millennials, they're not doing this and they're not doing that, tell them what to kiss and invite them to visit <laughs> archive where that notion is clearly dispelled. And this young man represents one of, I can't say how many, but when I go there, and the young woman who owns it, her name is Sharice Terry, um, the first day I was there, she said she was adopting me as her dad. And she's acted more like she's my mama. <laughs> and, and we should say, for those who don't yeah. know, it's near the intersection of LaSalle and Beatty's Ford Road. Yeah. It's in the same, um, yeah, the, opposite end of the Chase side Bank. where the Chase Bank is. Yeah. So, y yeah, uh, I hope I'm answering your question, but we have to look forward and what I value about it is that the millennials look to us for questions and answers, and we have to be open and honest with them. And part of Charlotte, as I said, when I came, it was 330,000 people, 32% black. As a community, we got behind school desegregation and other issues, and here we are, in 2023, 1.3 million people. Where did all of those people come from? All over the place. But I would tell you that many of them came here with no skin in the game, no care or desire about anything but themselves. And Charlotte has offered that to them. When we talk about communities, to some degree with some of my friends, when I hear them talk about gentrification and how they're resistant to it, I remember when white folks had the same conversations in their communities about Hidden Valley, Clanton Park, East Brook Woods, they complained that we were moving in. So to some degree, we have to look ourselves in the mirror and figure out where do I fit in this whole thing. 
to his point, because I think you were asking about how we form those connections. So one is looking for gathering spots where we can come together. Um, I'm curious, Ms. Count Scoggins, would you add on to that? And I'm, and, and as we, because I'm, I'm noticing we're getting close on time, I want to give you all an opportunity to just share what you would leave with them. So I'm assuming, Mr. Kuntz, I hear you saying connect mm -hmm. with this next generation in a very intentional way. Ms. Kelts Coggins, what well, would you add to that? Well, I guess I go back because, you know, those that know me know that my focus is always on young children because I think this is where it all starts. You know, people think that children have to, you have to wait till kids go to school in order for them to learn. But, you know, I've always said my philosophy is the children are, uh, learn at birth. So that's when it starts. So that has been my focus for over the last 40 years. So what I, what I also say is that, you know, we as a community, and I like using the word community, Ken, because we grew up with the word community. You know, people say, well, I live in this neighborhood. And I said, I don't live in neighborhoods. I live in communities. And so within those communities, those communities, a lot of things can happen. Yes, I live in Biddleville Smallwood. And Biddleville Smallwood, I don't know whether you know where that is, but it's on the west side across from Johnson C. Smith University. And yes, it is a community that is going through gentrification big time. <laughs> but what I also say that because that community has a community of history and legacy, it is important for me as a person who grew up in that community to make sure that that, leg that legacy and that history is maintained. So what I do is I fight for that to make sure. It's okay for you to move in next to me or down the street from me, but it's also important that the history of this community maintains. So what I do is what, I, what we need to do is we need to think about that in terms of working in our communities. I know where you're talking about archives. I have been there. That kind of thing needs to be able to happen in more of our communities where our young people can be able to come together, have conversations with seniors as ourselves, but with other people like you, like, well, like your peers. So those of you who live in communities, it is important that you be a part of that community. And those children that are in that community, it, it is important that you be a part of their lives. And go back to my statement that I say, and I say it all the time, don't let us live in this selfish society that we're in now. It's not about me, it's not about mine, it's not, but it's, uh, it's about all of us. So whatever you, your relationship with Ken, you take that relationship and you, and you take that relationship and you pass it on to somebody else. And that's what we have to do in order to be able to live in the kind of community that we all deserve to live in. Mr. Ferguson, the final word you'd like to leave everyone with. Well, actually, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm going to share something that I think most people here don't know. And it, it brings us back to why we're here today to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King. A few people know that on the day before, uh, uh, really on the day that Martin Luther King was shot and killed, <coughs> he was actually scheduled to be here in Charlotte. I remember it well because uh, at that time, he to to well, he was he was going to come to Justin C. Smith's <laughs> camp. Uh, so I'm I'm going to stand up so I'll be ready to go out to the bathroom as soon as I finish, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be right behind you. <laughs> But I won't go to the bathroom before I finish, I assure you of that. No, but seriously speaking, uh, I remember it well because I was on the phone with Dr. King the day before he died. Now, I didn't call him up and say, hey, Martin, how you doing? But at the time, I was managing the campaign of Dr. Reginald Hawkins, who was the first African-American to run for governor of, of North Carolina in the 20th century. So on that day, uh, Martin, uh, Dr. Reginald Hawkins had been in touch with uh, Dr. King to invite him to come to Charlotte to lead uh, a voter registration campaign from Charlotte 
and we were going to wind up in Wilmington. And I shall never forget when we were in the campaign office, which was located where the, uh, uh, the Hornet Stadium is now, uh, Dr. King called uh, uh, Dr. Hawkins from, uh, from Memphis, where he was. He said, Reggie, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I've got to tell you I'm not going to be able to come to Charlotte tomorrow as planned. We've got things going on here in Memphis that I have to stay and finish. That was when he was supporting the garbage worker strike in Memphis. So he said, I'm sorry I will come to Charlotte, but I won't be able to come tomorrow. We'll have to reschedule. And of course, uh, Dr. Hawkins responded that that's what he had. He understood that that's what he had to do and that they would reschedule. And it was the very next day that Dr. King was shot and killed. So I wanted to share that with you to let you know that Charlotte was going to be his next destination after Memphis. And had not that, that, that fateful bullet been fired the, 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 the day that it was in Memphis, Everything might have been different. Things may have been different in North Carolina. Things may have been different in Memphis. Things may have been different throughout the world. But I want you to remember that on the day that Dr. Martin Luther King died, he was on his way to Charlotte. And I, I, I think all the time what a difference that could have made if he could have taken that trip. It would have made a difference in all of our lives here in Charlotte, and likely given the impact that Dr. King had on the world, it may well have made a difference in the world that we know today. So those are my parting words with you, and I'm going to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We're gonna let him slip out. We're gonna let Mr. Kuntz slip out. And I just wanna share with you if you have a chance today, um, the students at Morehouse have put out a public service announcement in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King, and as you know, he was a Morehouse graduate. And I wanna leave us with this today, because as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm so grateful to our panelists for sharing their experience, for sharing some context around their lives and being so generous, because they are often asked to tell their stories. And they always say yes, because they believe in the importance of sharing the story. But we're here not just to hear their stories, but really to be motivated in whatever arena or circle you're working in to, as Mr. Ferguson said, do the right thing in front of you. So I leave you um, with this, and if you Google Morehouse PSA today, you'll see it. It's a one-minute video, but it lifts up these words from Dr. King that he spoke at Spelman College in 1960. And I think the thing that struck me about the video is you see young people, you see older people, and that's why the words are not just for those who were about, I believe it was a commencement speech. But he says, this is the most important period of your lives. What you decide now at this age, and I'll add here whether you're 10, whether you're 50, whether you're 60, but what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. Doors of opportunity are opening to each of you that were not open to your mothers and to your fathers. Be ready to enter those doors as they open. And you know this part of the speech. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to Dorothy Count Scoggins, James Ferguson, and Ken Kuntz. And my thanks to all here at the Gantt Center who worked so hard um, in their programming. Have a wonderful rest of the MLK Day. Thank you. I think, I think with showing these works at the Gantt Center, I'm able to speak on the topics that I speak to in all my work but I'm able to really like hammer it in. 
I think if painting is going to matter and it's not just going to be an adornment or just another pretty object that's being brought into the world, then I think painting needs to be tied to something. You know, I think it's very important to not escape these things, right? I think it's, it's, it's important to confront these feelings, these notions, these ideals. And so I try and harness that pain, harness those emotions on that topic and relate that through picture making. These paintings are tied to spirituality, they're tied to history, and they're, they're tied to something that's also deeply personal for him, you know, and his family. I started as a graphic designer, but at the same time I had a very strong hand. I was um, a really good illustrator, so when I was thinking about stepping outside of graphic design, I felt like painting made the most sense. Yeah, growing up, I mean, my father always said, Any, in anything that you do, you should honor God, right? As I was becoming an adult and my own man, that time frame with also the time of me maturing and becoming a maker, those timelines are very, uh, they're very connected. You know, abstract painting for me, it, it lies in energy. It lies in the moment. But at the same time, I guess as I mature as a painter too, you know, concepts do come to mind. So it's about marriaging those two sides, right? Having a, a distinct idea of something to make or a concept on how to approach a, a picture, but at the same time, leaving that room for abstraction to happen, right? Where it's just fluidity and flow and energy. I describe Reginald Sylvester's um, art style as abstract expressionism, but also action painting. I also consider him to be a mixed media artist who's not only doing painting, but is also working in assemblage, and also working to some extent quite sculpturally. And so when I think about making these abstract pictures, again, they're from my own experiences, things that I go to, but there also is mes messages lined through these works. You know, I think that he's also part of a, a long lineage of abstract painters, both black and, 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 and non-black painters as well. And I think his work fits very well in that, in that conversation and in that lineage. When I think about, as far as like an abstract painter, right, one who's dedicated themselves to their practice and their work, someone like William de Kooning comes to mind. Someone like Frank Bowling comes to mind. It's a combination of different artists that I look at, but again, not just the art that they make or the work that they make, but more so the careers that they've had. Reginald Sylvester is an artist that I have a, like a great deal of, of belief in his, his trajectory and his future um, as an artist. And when I was thinking about bringing an exhibition of his work to the Gantt Center, it just really dawned on me that this was like the, it was the perfect moment for both the Gantt Center and for Reginald Sylvester because you have an artist who I think is on the cusp of just a tremendous career ahead of him. And you have an institution that is reaching this milestone that I think is, is an indicator of its future as well, that it has a great future ahead of it. And to bring those two things together, to be a curator that can kind of make those, those two things happen, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing having a solo museum show is a big deal, but I think having a solo museum exhibition in, in the state where you were born, where your family members get to come and see your work displayed in a museum, that's so special. You know, I want this to be a show where, you know, black and brown and indigenous folks can come and really feel, you know, what we've been going through. You know, so what better place to do it than to be at the Harvey B. Gantt Center?
I'm here to celebrate the opening of Men of Change, Power, Triumph, Truth. This exhibit is a celebration of black excellence, of the ability to overcome adversity and the gifts that our elders have provided for our children. This extraordinary exhibit invites us to look at American culture through the stories of 27 iconic African-American men who have changed the world. Philosophers and writers spanning generations from W.E.B. Du Bois to, to James Baldwin, Stokely Carmichael, Tanisha Coates, Bob Moses, musicians spanning from Duke Ellington to Kendrick Lamar, filmmakers like Ryan Kogler who brought Wakanda to life. All of these men who stood with their heads held high, who understand that even today it is a time and a season for men of courage. And also, this exhibition helps shine light on local black men that are making a difference in their community. So we want to make sure we help introduce them to the community and thank them for the great work they're doing as they too are men of change in our hometown. We have spaces in both museums. If you're a men of change and tell your own story to also put those stories to front to share that. That is how we grow as a community. And so it is important for the best of the best to be on exhibit because these men are examples that we want our children to emulate. That's what this exhibition means. It means pride. It means understanding the shoulders we stand on and looking forward to a better tomorrow. Think about black philanthropy, we're talking about all the ways in which people of African descent give, wherever they may be across the diaspora. Um, and African American philanthropy is a particular expression of that. So the ways in which African Americans give of themselves to support each other, to address issues related to a community, and also to press for liberation. And so one of the things that characterizes it is a focus on, on family, on community, uh, kind of giving inward and then letting that ripple outward. Um, there's a Faith is an important role in African American philanthropy and uh, the roles, the historic roles that the black church has played and, and also other black religious traditions in challenging people to give, showing people how to give and, and giving them ways of practicing that. Um, and so it's a big tradition that involves, you know, again, responding to needs on the ground every day in the community, but also dealing with the larger issues related to social justice um, and change for, for everyone. I wanted to investigate this history of African-American philanthropy more closely. Um, she's a very well-known figure for her achievements in beauty culture and for being called what has been called the first self-made female millionaire. Um, but I really wanted to know about the ways in which she engaged in philanthropic giving because it was talked about but wasn't deeply investigated. And what I discovered was that in the process of kind of following and pursuing her story, it opened up an, a window into the broader culture and history of giving by and for African-American. Americans. And so really it started with a curiosity about her and what she was doing as an important historical figure and then it blossomed out and provided many more insights into long-standing practices that even though she lived 100 years ago, you can still see these things showing up every day in the community, again from churches to sororities to giving circles like NGAP and others, um, the kinds of supporters who will fund the Harvey Gantt Center. Um, this type of giving has always been around and it's been a vital important part of community life. So I wanted to tell that story. The Gantt Center is a powerful representation of this legacy because of the way it upholds history and culture and art. Um, you know, historically, African Americans have not only given or been involved philanthropically for issues like education and, and health and social services, but also for the arts. 
There's a rich tradition of African-American art that's been a very important part of our experience and also for the struggle for, for liberation. And so black artists have always kind of painted or, or, or sculpted or represented us in their productions. And so the Gantt Center, by supporting artists, you know, helps to keep that alive and by providing space for people to come together to talk about leading issues of the day in Charlotte, across the state, or across the country is very important. It's also an important site for mobilization um, and the work that was done during the pandemic to meet the needs of the community. So I think I see the Gantt Center as a very powerful representation and contemporary expression of this long, rich, deep history. But it's, it's essential that they exist because again, it's a part, an important part of our history. Um, it's an important part of, of the ways in which we can imagine new worlds, we can imagine a just world. Um, artists give, give voice and give vision and give sound and, and expression to our deepest yearnings as human beings. And so the ways in which Gantt nurtures that is important. Um, and so it's important for black arts institutions to be recognized and be fully supported. They're underfunded. They have a long history of being neglected or ignored. So it's important that they gain the support they need, again, to keep these voices alive, to keep this expression alive. And again, as in keeping with most black organizations, they don't just do one thing. They'll do many things. They are responding to local needs here on the ground in Charlotte, which is an extension of that, that same mission of this artistic expression and emphasizing and amplifying the culture. I think with showing these works at the Gantt Center, I'm able to speak on the topics that I speak to in all my work, but I'm able to really like hammer it in. I think if painting is going to matter and it's not just gonna be an adornment or just another pretty object that's being brought into the world, then I think painting needs to be tied to something. You know, I think it's very important to not escape these things, right? I think it's, it's, it's important to confront these feelings, these notions, these ideals. And so I try and harness that pain, harness those emotions on that topic and relate that through picture making. These paintings are tied to spirituality, they're tied to history, and they're, they're tied to something that's also deeply personal for him, you know, and his family. I started as a graphic designer, but at the same time, I had a very strong hand. I was um, a really good illustrator. So when I was thinking about stepping outside of graphic design, I felt like painting made the most sense. Yeah, growing up, I mean, my father always said, Any, in anything that you do, you should honor God, right? As I was becoming an adult and my own man, that time frame with also the time of me maturing and becoming a maker, those timelines are very, uh, they're very connected. You know, abstract painting for me, it, it lies in energy, it lies in the moment. But at the same time, I guess as I mature as a painter too, you know, concepts do come to mind. So it's about marriaging those two sides, right? Having a, 
a distinct idea of something to make or a concept on how to approach a, a picture, but at the same time leaving that room for abstraction to happen, right? Where it's just fluidity and flow and energy. I describe Reginald Sylvester's um, art style as abstract expressionism, but also action painting. I also consider him to be a mixed media artist who's not only doing painting, but is also working in assemblage, and also working to some extent quite sculpturally. And so when I think about making these abstract pictures, Again, they're from my own experiences, things that I go to, but there also is mes messages lined through these works. You know, I think that he's also part of a, a long lineage of abstract painters, both black and, 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 and non-black painters as well. And I think his work fits very well in that, in that conversation and in that lineage. When I think about as far as like an abstract painter, right? One who's dedicated themselves to their practice and their work. Someone like William de Kooning comes to mind. Someone like Frank Bowling comes to mind. It's a combination of different artists that I look at, but again, not just the art that they make or the work that they make, but more so the careers that they've had. Reginald Sylvester is an artist that I have a, like a great deal of, of belief in his, his trajectory and his future um, as an artist. And when I was thinking about bringing an exhibition of his work to the Gantt Center, it just really dawned on me that this was like the, it was the perfect moment for both the Gantt Center and for Reginald Sylvester because you have an artist who I think is on the cusp of just a tremendous career ahead of him. And you have an institution that is reaching this milestone that I think is, is an indicator of its future as well, that it has a great future ahead of it. And to bring those two things together, to be a curator that can kind of make those, those two things happen, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. Having a solo museum show is a big deal, but I think having a solo museum exhibition in, in the state where you were born, where your family members get to come and see your work displayed in a museum, that's so special. You know, I want this to be a show where, you know, black and brown and indigenous folks can come and really feel, you know, what we've been going through. You know, so what better place to do it than to be at the Harvey B. Gantt Center? I'm here to celebrate the opening of Men of Change, Power, Triumph, Truth. This exhibit is a celebration of black excellence, of the ability to overcome adversity and the gifts that our elders have provided for our children. This extraordinary exhibit invites us to look at American culture through the stories of 27 iconic African-American men who have changed the world. Philosophers and writers spanning generations from W.E.B. Du Bois to, to James Baldwin, Stokely Carmichael, Tanisha Coates, Bob Moses, musicians spanning from Duke Ellington to Kendrick Lamar, filmmakers like Ryan Kogler who brought Wakanda to life. All of these men who stood with their heads held high, who understand that even today it is a time and a season for men of courage. And also this exhibition helps shine light on local black men that are making a difference in their community. So we want to make sure we help introduce them to the community and thank them for the great work they're doing as they too are men of change in our hometown. We have spaces in both museums. If you're a men of change and tell your own story to also put those stories to front to share that. That is how we grow as a community. 
And so it is important for the best of the best to be on exhibit because these men are examples that we want our children to emulate. That's what this exhibition means. It means pride. It means understanding the shoulders we stand on and looking forward to a better tomorrow. about black philanthropy, we're talking about all the ways in which people of African descent give, wherever they may be across the diaspora. Um, and African-American philanthropy is a particular expression of that. So the ways in which African-Americans give of themselves to support each other, to address issues related to a community, and also to press for liberation. And so one of the things that characterizes it is a focus on, on family, on community, a kind of giving inward and then letting that ripple outward. Um, there's a faith is an important role in African-American philanthropy and uh, the roles, the historic roles that the black church has played and, and also other black religious traditions in challenging people to give, showing people how to give and, and giving them ways of practicing that. Um, and so it's a big tradition that involves, you know, again, responding to needs on the ground every day in the community, but also dealing with the larger issues related to social justice um, and change for, for everyone. I wanted to investigate this history of African-American philanthropy more closely. Um, she's a very well-known figure for her achievements in beauty culture and for being called what has been called the first self-made female millionaire. Um, but I really wanted to know about the ways in which she engaged in philanthropic giving because it was talked about but wasn't deeply investigated. And what I discovered was that in the process of kind of following and pursuing her story, it opened up an, a window into the broader culture and history of giving by and for African-Americans. Americans. And so really it started with a curiosity about her and what she was doing as an important historical figure and then it blossomed out and provided many more insights into long-standing practices that even though she lived 100 years ago, you can still see these things showing up every day in the community, again from churches to sororities to giving circles like INGAP and others, um, the kinds of supporters who will fund the Harvey Gantt Center. Um, this type of giving has always been around and it's been a vital important part of community life. So I wanted to tell that story. The Gantt Center is a powerful representation of this legacy because of the way it upholds history and culture and art. Um, you know, historically, African Americans have not only given or been involved philanthropically for issues like education and, and health and so. Uh, we are so happy to have you all here today uh, to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King um, and all he stood for. So again, thank you for being here. We're pleased to partner with the Harvey B. Gantt Center uh, to bring you our community conversation for today. So you all are here to hear about um, our discussion on It Takes a Village, uh, the importance of mentorship in black male youth. And so when I thought about the theme for It Takes a Village, and that's kind of the overarching theme um, for us and the Gantt Center this year to celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, one of my favorite quotes from him says, um, and I quote, we all came over here, I'm paraphrasing, we all came over on different ships, but we're in the same boat now, unquote. And so to me, that means that regardless of religion, our race, um, our gender, we all are a part of the same community. And so we all should be concerned about the success and the well-being of each of us in the community and be a part of creating solutions. And so when we think about black males, we think about the unique challenges and circumstances that they have to face here. Uh, and we need to learn more about what we can do to help. So hopefully uh, today and this afternoon, you'll walk away with here learning more about um, their plight and what we all can do as a community to help support and undergird them so they can be successful and be all that we know they can be. And so today I am joined by Mr. Reggie Singleton, who is the founder of The Males Place, um, a group. Yes, let's give it up for Reggie. 
He is the founder of A Male's Place, an organization that works with black males ages 12 to 18. Uh, he does a phenomenal job. Um, he's also the recipient of uh, the Ford Motor Company's Men of Change Community Award um, for the great work that he does with black males. So let's give a round of applause for that. And so we'll hear a little bit more from him later. And we're also joined by the fantastic Mr. Greg Jackson. Yes. Give it up, yes, yes. He is the founder of Heal Charlotte. Uh, he does great work here in the community around the youth, housing, um, and anti-violence work um, in this city. He is the recipient of the 2021 Charlatan of the Year Award, one of them through the Charlotte Magazine. And so we are thrilled to have both of them here today with us to have this powerful conversation and they will be leading you all um, in a little while. Um, but before, before we get started, I do want to mention um, our Men of Change exhibit that we at Levine share uh, as well with the Gantt Center. If you all have not had a chance to visit yet, please do so you can learn more um, and experience this inspirational and really powerful exhibit about the, the contributions, positive contributions of black men. Uh, so please check that out. Um, also, we have our local Men of Change exhibit, which will highlight some other local men of change who are doing great things here in our community as well. So please feel free to go and visit and learn more about those men. A few men who I do want to highlight who are a part of the Men of Change exhibit, um, who are pioneers um, in their fields, but also who are great mentors. And the first one I'll mention is Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him a few months back. That was amazing. He is 90 years old, still just as sharp, I mean, as a whip, comical, and just so powerful. Um, I, it was an honor to meet him. But as you know, he walked alongside Martin Luther King. Um, he definitely paved the way for others. Um, he was a mentor to one of my favorite men of change, former Congressman John Lewis. Um, and others, yes, let's give it up for John Lewis, yes. Um, and other men who came um, alongside him along the way in the civil rights movement. And so we know that uh, he would be very pleased that we're continuing to celebrate the legacy and all that he and Dr. King fought for. Uh, another man of change um, who you can learn more about in the exhibit is Dick Gregory. Uh, let's give it up for Dick Gregory. Uh, a lot of people know Dick Gregory um, as being a comedian, but Dick Gregory um, was a civil rights activist. He used his humor to confront the ills of racism and discrimination in this country and to describe what it was like to be black in America. Uh, Dick Gregory was pivotal in helping to organize marches and other movements, and again, he paved the way for other comedians coming behind him to be frank and honest in their commentary and do the same thing. So we're, we're really pleased and honored for, to have him be um, here for one of the men of change um, that you can learn more about and for the mentoring that he did a long way to uplift others in our community and other comedians coming behind him to do the same. And finally, um, I will mention Bayard Rustin. Uh, let's give it up for Bayard Rustin. Uh, he also was a very powerful man of change, uh, civil rights activist. He was a founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. A lot of people may not know that. Um, he was really the person who introduced Dr. King to Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence during that time. Again, um, just an honorable man, passionate about civil rights and also um, a passionate advocate for gay rights and for people to love whom they love and be who they are. So um, those men served as powerful mentors for those coming behind him um, and ha have influenced all of us um, today. And, and this exhibit is such a powerful example of that. So please, please, if you have not, please visit both locations um, to learn more about these amazing men. And so now, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Reggie Singleton, Mr. Greg Jackson, so they can explain to you a little bit more about what they do, their experiences, and how we all can get involved. So, Reggie. Thank you, Sister Karen. Greetings. Hotep, everyone. All right. It's good to see everybody. Uh, my name is Baba Reggie Singleton. 
fact, Omachi Baba Reggie Singleton. Uh, these titles were bestowed on me by my family and people down in the Gullah Geechee regions of Charleston. So I'm from Gullah Geechee Nation down in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I first and foremost want to give honor and glory to the Creator. <clears throat> okay. want to give great gratitude and blessings to the ancestors. Amen. Also want to recognize the great work of our Mashari. And Mashari is a, is a key Swahili word, means guide and to advise. As we break down and go into our little bit into the uh, operations of the Mills Place organizations, get into a little bit more detail, we'll, we'll be able to share more of that with you. But we have uh, the Males Place family right here. We have uh, Masharis, elders, parents, and warriors. Right. Thank you all for your support. And thank you all for being a part of this very important discussion. I want to thank my dear brother Greg Jackson too. It's always good to work with you. Always an honor to work with you, dear brother, on a very important topic here. What we're going to do is to, uh, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Uh, this is my most important credential right here. I could sit here. I could tell you this and tell you that, but the fact that I'm a husband who is devoted to and honor and have been married to this black woman for 32 years. Mm -hmm. In fact, she, she is probably most responsible for her and my mom being for me being what I am today. Again, I'm a native of the Sea Islands. I work in public health, so I have a degree from uh, University of South Carolina. Gamecocks, Gamecocks, okay. <laughs> no Gamecocks in the house, okay. All right, <laughs> All right. and so I'm the uh, founder and the executive director of the Mills Place. So, um, thank you. Okay, next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so mentorship is, uh, is the wheelhouse of the male's place. So we're a 501c3, multidimensional, nonprofit organization where we're governed by our board of directors and our goals and objectives are implemented and are executed by our Masharis, our elders, our parents, our warriors, our volunteers, and partners. So while you all may see my face from time to time, there's a whole slew of people out there who have made incredible contributions over the years. As I say, God has sent us so many angels to continue to bless this mission. We're an organization that is, uh, uh, we use a logic model right here. These are some of the inputs right here. You got the Masharis, the elders, the directors, et cetera. And again, the young men are 12 to 18 years of age. We're, we're non-religious. Non I'm a very spiritual man. I'm not a re very religious man, but... Uh, but we're not, we're, we're not, we're a non-religious group. Malcolm often talked about leaving your religion in the closet because again, our aim is to come together. And when you start to bring religion, sometimes a, a, a divider. Um, we have three major tenets. It's a, it is a mentorship or black manhood training. And much of what we do with the mentorship, and we'll break that word down too for us, that whole training mentorship piece is for 12 to 18 years of age, and we draw on time-honored traditions. There are thousands of years of history where African people were so compelled that they loved their children and they understood that in order to uh, survive, it was necessary to inculcate, to instill, and to, to say who you are and what is expected of you. So they never left a chance that we would just be okay by ourselves. But of course, 
our traditions, our customs and mores and folkways and families were decimated and so they took away our ability to properly socialize our children. So the manhood training was a socializing uh, agent. It was a means to socialize, to tell the young person who, it is, who they are, what is expected from them, and what problems you are to solve. It, the aim was to solve problems. Some people think that mentorship is for wayward boys. It's for disciplinary uh, purposes. It's for children that are in trouble. Really, in the African uh, forms and customs, everybody was socialized. Everybody was socialized because it wasn't so much how smart you were, how talented you were, but it is you understanding your basic obligation and duty as children as a male or as a female, you understood what your basic duties and obligations were. They were very clear on that. And whatever, wherever you go, you took that warriorhood with you. So it's not so much as we see in modern times today, you know, on uh, what jobs you have, what degrees you have, where you live, et cetera, but it was your solving fundamental problems uh, that exist in all communities. So mentorship, agriculture, and social justice are our three tenets. And we also have our travel program. We have a regional and international program that has included trips to uh, Ghana and Cuba, and, and we're slated to go to Kemet, to Egypt, this coming uh, June. Yes, thank you, thank you. So uh, just wanted to briefly introduce that to you, and I'll come back and break it down a little bit more, but I wanted Brother Greg to go ahead and get started. Is it? Is that how we're going to do that? That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, give it up for Baba Reggie. <laughs> My slide is coming up. Should All right. Take them through? Should I just take them through? I'm, look, I'm enjoying the slides. How y'all doing? I'm Greg Jackson. I'm the founder of Hill Charlotte. Um, and just like Reggie said, I want to give it up to my God. Um, I'm a follower of Christ. Absolutely love everything he's done in my life. And uh, without the Holy Spirit that resides in me, none of this stuff that you're about to see is possible. So let me get that out the way real quick. Um, I also want to give it up to those that came before me. I am a standing on shoulders of giants. Um, not just the ones that we know in the books, but the ones in my family. Uh, Paula Bailey. Um, Akram Ukda. My grandfather, Leonard Bailey. Uh, and those that came before them. Um, activism runs in my bloodline. Uh, and by me knowing that, I've been able to walk into my purpose my purpose in life. And I now tell everybody I'm a happy free man, for I'm not chained to anything else but my purpose and my God. Um, I'm the founder of, oh, let me shout out my mama, who's here. Uh, everybody give it up for my mama. You gotta do that. <laughs> I try to make sure she gets her praise and her just due after I done put her through so much as a kid. <laughs> Make sure she gets the honor all the time, man. I am the founder of a nonprofit organization called Heal Charlotte. Uh, my story is uh, a little different than Barbara Reggie's. Uh, my story is about restoration and revival. Uh, I come from humble beginnings. Um, some of them I put on myself as a young man in the streets. I'm from the Bronx, New York. Let's go. The, the only borough that starts with the. <laughs> Boogie down Bronx. Um, but uh, coming up in the Bronx, I had access to the other side of the tracks. So not that I needed to take advantage of those things, but it was around me in my environment. Um, I did end up 
being involved in gang activity, selling drugs, um, not knowing how to love a woman. Um, and with that, I ended up doing a year on, in jail on Rikers Island. Um, and when I came out of that, uh, my mother seen that I needed an elevation and she said, you better move to Charlotte. And I came down here and it was a uh, one bedroom for $700. Now, somebody in New York, that was heaven. <laughs> um, that was heaven. The sad part is that doesn't exist anymore, does it? So I apologize to all of the Charlatans um, for I'm part of the demographic that rose up the market value. Um, but this is Hill Charlotte. Uh, Shout out to the Hill Charlotte team, those of you that are in the building, the Stop the Violence team, those of you that are in the building. The conception of Hill Charlotte started in 2016. Anybody remember that big commotion? It was marching in the middle of the street for a young man named Keith Lamont Scott. Everybody say his name, Keith Lamont Scott. That situation and event changed my life. I started to realize I could no longer march and not do work. The protest is 365 days a year, not when you feel like it. It is an absolute responsibility and I wear it as such. Next slide. So we are a place-based organization in 85 in Sugar Creek. Why are we place-based? Because I don't want to bounce around town. I believe there's supposed to be real outcomes where you live at. And if the people can't brag about you where you come from, then you ain't did enough work yet. So I'm still in 85 in Sugar Creek, doing neighborhood revitalization with a holistic approach. Why holistic? Because I never met a parent and I didn't have to deal with their children. I never met a neighborhood that I didn't have to do rental assistance in or it was getting gentrified. And I never had to work with children and not worry about their education. I didn't have to worry, I always had to worry about food disparities, transportation, the environment, beautification, all of these things that are a part of having a healthy neighborhood. So we're holistic. Uh, we wanna have safe neighborhoods, who doesn't, right? Next slide, next slide. Uh, so we do housing and family stability. I'm most known for a capital campaign that we started in 2019 to buy a hotel uh, that I wanted to uh, and still do want to operate in. Right now we have a 90 day program that happens at the Baymont Inn in 85 and Sugar Creek where we house families for 90 days with free lodging that is experiencing homelessness. As you all know, there's nowhere that a man and a woman can go together that is experiencing homelessness with their children. They will be separated by the shelter system. And I thought that was a problem. I also thought it was a problem that we don't own anything in our community. And I'm a big, 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 big advocate for practicing what you preach. So if I tell people, don't live check to check, I will not live grant to grant. If I tell people, own your home, I'm going to own the building that I operate in. We also have safe neighborhoods, Stop the Violence Day. We have our Stop the Violence Initiative. Unfortunately, I lost a mentee to gun violence. Ruben Contreras, a young Latin brother that I had the pleasure of being with for four years of his life and watched him um, grow. And he lost his life to a stray bullet that had nothing to do with him, 16 years old. I pray for his family every day. But that's what happens when you're mentoring, right? You never know what's gonna happen with these kids. We also, we have our mentorship program. We have an after-school program at Martin Luther King Middle School. And it's not a coincidence that I'm here speaking on Martin Luther King Day. My children that are in my, uh, my program are very excited that I get to do something like this today and brag about them, not about me, because they're absolutely amazing. I have three daughters that uh, I'm a girl dad. 
So I don't just know how to mentor boys. <laughs> I know how to raise some children up. I have a lot of children, uh, three biological, and I don't know how many spiritual. Y'all pray for me. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so why did we start Stop the Violence? I want to focus on our Stop the Violence initiative. Why? Because our black boys are dying in the middle of the street almost every day. We're over 100 homicides again last year with almost 40%, 44% of our young boys from the age of 16 to 24 dying. I think that's a problem. I think it needs to be talked about and advocated for. I think we need to be tenacious, courageous, and bold about it. So everywhere I go, I talk about stopping the violence. I talk about the decretion of the homicide rate. Next slide. What do we do to stop the violence? We do a stop the violence media campaign for these children because I want them to know how to post with etiquette, with responsibility. I wanna give them the tools to be able to use social media and I wanna be able to be with them when I'm not with them. So we did a photo shoot in the media campaign where they get to tell their stories. We partnered with a bunch of organizations and community leaders where they get to tell their story. My man Travis Jackson is here from HBCU Pride Nation. He was also one of the brand ambassadors of the Stop the Violence Initiative. We have a Stop the Violence three-on-three -three basketball tournament. Why basketball? Because I like to meet people where they at. I like to meet these boys on what they like to do. And then I sneak in what I like to do too. And I give them some education and I give them some knowledge. But I make sure that they get their physical needs met first. And then we have a Stop the Violence concert style event. Why? Because I'm going to go in the club and I'm going to get those that don't know about this work. Why are you in the club? Because that's where people getting shot at. Right in the parking lot, arguing about a park, right in the, in the club, get out, argue about a parking lot. Minute situation turns major and somebody lost their life. So I'd rather bring some positive vibes to nightlife. If that means I need to tell the DJ, don't you play anything that sounds like gun violence, then that's what I'm gonna do. Courageous, tenacious, and bold about this work. I'm ready to go to the dark places and bring the light. Next slide. Hey, they go my man right here. Anybody know Brother Marifa Ukweli from the League of Intelligence? If you don't, look him up. So we started a Stop the Violence workshop, 12-week workshop. Why would you start a workshop? Because I wasn't focused on violence when I was doing mentorship at first. I wasn't focused on system breaking and system changing at first. At first, I thought you can give young black boys some advice, the resources, and they will work it out. But we didn't address that there are systems in place for them to fail. After long talks with my brother, I said, we need to bring this education to civic leaders, to people in the community, and especially to these young people. They need to know what the root cause of gun violence is. They need to know that it's not just them. They need to know that Western society has set it up for them to fail and to get in the school to prison pipeline or to lose their life and not experience their purpose because they are supposed to die. Next slide, next slide. So what we talk about in this workshop, understanding the mind of the street, how poor communities are created, the miseducation of the Negro, who benefits off of uh, poverty and black undevelopment and violence? Who benefits off that? My brother Marifa Ukweli talks about the ghettos versus the golden age. These kids need to know who they were before they came here, how we acted. Why are we so hospitable? Because that's who we naturally are. Why do we focus on the village in Ubuntu? Because that's who we naturally are. And if in this society, we are out of place. 
and we got to get back to where we came from. And we talk about how to build power. Here go some quick objectives. We list the primary factors of violence, examine the effectiveness of policies and programs, analyze the psychological effects of poverty, uh, compare and contrast different cultural value systems, explain and defy the key factors that cause communities to be underdeveloped. Man, we talk about the black bourgeoisie. We talk about, uh, we read The Code of the Streets by Elijah Anderson how East New York became a ghetto. Highlight agencies that benefit from violence. Yeah, we call them all out. Violence is a billion dollar, billion dollar. <laughs> Everybody's profiting off of black boys dying. Next slide, next slide. Uh, this is some, next slide, this is some pictures from our Stop the Violence Day. You can go to the next slide again. These are cool little videos that we don't need to watch. Shout out to my mother. She's been a wordsmith since I can remember when I was eight. She wrote my first rap. I think I was eight. I don't know how old I was. You know, I make jokes all the time, right? We're, we're a Christian family. We believe in Christ. First words of my rap when I was, when I was young. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. <laughs> yes, but my mother knew, listen, I serve a black Jesus, an African Jesus, a bronze skin Jesus, a wool haired Jesus, you understand? Um, so my mother, being the wordsmith that she is, created a pledge. She made a pledge. I asked her, I said, Ma, you got to put your gifts. I need you. And she made a pledge that everyone that goes through this workshop this is why we do the work that we do. How you doing? That's right. <laughs> so, I'll read one line of the pledge. I pledge to be the best person and citizen that I could be. I will live to bring peace and not violence. I will not harm my male and female neighbors, community, but will handle them with the same care that I would give to my own family, friends, and loved ones. It takes a village to raise the next village, and this is working. Can you imagine a bunch of young people reading this and signing it before we start? They absolutely love it. They feel empowered by this. But they know that it's a pledge that they will live by for the rest of their life. It ain't for one day. Kelly Little, what's going on, brother? Next slide. Next slide. So this is what we've done is the impact. Uh, we've had 73 participants in our orientation, 35 participants in the workshop, 14 graduates. Shout out to Ira from Bunk 57, who's one of the graduates. Over 350 attendees in our events. Uh, over 150 gun locks we have given out to young people that we know uh, might have a possible problem, uh, might get into some trouble, some parents that might have guns inside the house. We have to lock our guns up. Keep your guns out your cars. Keep them out your glove compartments because these kids are breaking in cars just to get the gun. They will leave your purse, leave your money. They are looking for the guns. Lock your guns up. Please be safe with them. Um, and then we've had community financial impact. What is that? That means I raise money. So when people do the job, they get paid. When kids are posting, about Hill Charlotte, if you see any of my mentees posting about Hill Charlotte, they have gotten paid to do that. I incentivize the program because the enemy and the opposition will take advantage of every lane. They will help them get money. They will meet their physical needs. And I know my kid's hungry. I know they're trying to help mama out, trying to help dad out. They're trying to pay a bill at 14. So we have had kids get paid up to $1,250 for posting about an event because that's the day and age that we live in. They're creating their resume to be social impact leaders. Next slide. This is our after school program. Y'all come check us out at Martin Luther King Middle School. I'll talk more about that. Um, and we'll get to the, to the rest of the presentation after that. I think I'm finished now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Greg. Awesome. Awesome. 
Can we um, go back to the uh, third slide, please? Great job, brother. Thank you. Great job. And just to give you a little context with the organization, uh, the Mills Place has been around since 1993. So we are, uh, we're not a Johnny Come Lately. Uh, we're a very serious organization and provide very deep programming with our young men. Uh, again, I've, this is part of our team right here with Sharis, the elders, the warriors, and the parents here. And we meet twice a week. Uh, on Wednesdays, we do our manhood training. And uh, can, can you go back to the third slide, please? Is this the third? Uh, we do our weekly manhood training on Wednesdays from 6 to 8. And we cover, uh, it's a holistic development process. It's about development. It's about educating them, modeling for them, training them using time-honored methods and techniques to bring them along. And on Saturdays is when we do our second of our tenants, and that's our um, agriculture. So I'm a certified master gardener, as is uh, one of our other Masharis, or, or one of our other elders, and we grow twice a year. We teach black boys not only how to grow and produce, but why it's necessary for them to be able to not only be self-sufficient, but why they should profit from and benefit from what they do. And not mere be consumers at any and any or anything that we do. Controlling our systems, our economic systems, our food systems is so crucial toward addressing the manhood. You're not a you know, the, the way we look at it is if you do not provide, you don't protect, and if you don't guide your family, you fundamentally failed as a man. And certainly we can't be the exception. We can't be the only ethnic group that failed to do this. And we're about winning. We are, we are, uh, we are very intentional about engaging and instilling values, lessons, and teachings into our young black men. This is a picture right here of our blessing of the harvest. We uh, not only grow and produce and educate not only the young warriors, their families, but the entire community, particularly the seniors along the Beatty's Ford Road. And again, we're consistent. This is rather there's a pandemic or, or economic downturn or whatever. Guys, we don't take no days off. And for those of you who've seen our work over the years, uh, we're very consistent about that. So these young men can tell you everything from the water cycle. They can tell you about micro, macro nutrients and fertilizers. Uh, they can tell you about retail and, and customer services, et cetera. Again, because they're interested, or we're interested in them controlling their own economic and food markets. Because that's what, that's what men do all over the world. That's what we do, so we're very intentional about that. We don't apologize for that, okay? And we will work with anyone, next slide. We will work with anyone. In fact, uh, here is a piece where we had CBS Evening News and we were on the front page of the Charlotte Observer this past year, and Hello. not only, <laughs> Not only on the front page of the Observer, but they took like four full pages to uh, on the front page, and then like four full pages there. This is Scott Pelley and the CBS Evening News crew, the 60 Minutes crew that came down and did a pretty good job capturing the work of the elders and the Masharis and these young people. And um, so it was it was important that um, that we get this recognition, but it was something that we've learned that we've had to do the work with or without the recognition, that we will do with or without the funding. Now, we love funding, and we appreciate the, the monies uh, that we got from the Ford Fund and uh, with the Men of Change campaign, with the Levine and the, uh, the Gantt, uh, et cetera. But we're an organization 
because this is existential. This is a survival that we're dealing with right here. So, guys, I, what I'm saying is we're a very serious organization. And I hope you all understand that. Uh, next slide, please. This is some of the ways, uh, it, and what I want to do is to show you some history here. I want to show you some longevity. This was an old rites of passage that we did right here in 002, I believe it was. This was one that we just did uh, for Kwanzaa on the 28th of this past December. And we did one in um, uh, 2020 as well. So when a young man comes through the organization, we move him through, the parents are engaged, the warriors are engaged, the Masharis are deeply engaged, and the Mashari has uh, weekly contacts with them. So part of their job is to do weekly check-ins with them, see how they're doing, follow their grades, et cetera, and um, when we then see them on Saturdays. We take them through these rites of passage here. These are various trials, educational, physical, psychological, spiritual, cultural trial, and then we take them to this in, through this initiation. Uh, we have four major African kingdoms that we focus on. Those are the Nubian kingdom out of, out of um, or, or the Ashanti kingdom out of Ghana, the Dogon kingdom out of Mali, the Nubian kingdom uh, from Kemet in Egypt and Sudan, and then the Zulu kingdom uh, in South Africa. So we, we focus a great deal on those great, wonderful kingdoms and we look at the black history, the black experience from a very affirming standpoint, not from a broken down, never did anything, never been anything kind of, but a very affirming way. So a very positive, but very firm organization. And I can't say enough about how much I appreciate the work of uh, uh, Masharis. Next slide, please. These are some uh, additional um, opportunities to enrich our young people on the left here. This, is a, this was at Tuskegee here, and this is called Lifting the Veil of Ignorance. This was a statue that was um, done in honor of Booker T. Washington. And we've studied the works of Booker T. Washington, his uh, industriousness, his uh, understanding the necessity to do uh, trade and skill work, and not just liberal arts and going to college. Um, but anyway, this was uh, lifting the veil here. This was a, a, an experience right here in the Baltimore, D.C. area. Uh, this was the A&T 4 right here. Yes, sir. Okay. Any Aggies out there? Aggie pride? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, my son just graduated from there. Yes, sir. I'm glad y'all out of my pocket, too. <laughs> okay. Now, this was our Sankofa experience right here this past, um, this is down at uh, Sullivan's Island Beach down in Charleston. This was one of the sites right here where just before they would take our ancestors into the ports to be sold, they would bathe them and wash them and get them, you know, ready to be sold. This is uh, a very spiritual waiting in the water here. We're locking arms right there. Very spiritual experience for our young people. And you can see the diversity and the depths of the experience that we provide for these young people. So we're about total development. And when you develop the child where they are able to deal with some of those psychological, some of those pervasive psychological um, character traits that was so deeply embedded in us, like self-hate. There were some other pernicious ones, but the self-hate, where we hate ourselves and therefore hate others that look like us, have been so deeply ingrained in us, it's been very difficult to overcome. But when you teach a man, when you teach a person knowledge of self, then a lot of the other symptomatic symptoms of a sick individual or an unsocialized individual will take its proper place. Next slide, please. These were some of the international, this was Ghana right here. This is uh, Kwame Nkrumah here. Uh, on whatever, back would never. Uh, this is in Cuba right here. Uh, beautiful experience there. Uh, next slide. Okay, and this is, uh, 
the warriors in the garden right here. You can see some of their work right here and the, uh, the cultural stuff. We grow everything. So if you want to see positive images of black males, serious, honest images of hardworking black men and boys working together, then you need to check out TMP and support TMP. Amen. All right, next slide, please. These are some recommended readings right here. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I tried to put them in some category or in a way in which I think that this is a minimal baseline reading here. It's not necessarily all that needs to be, but these are some, like the awakening, the natural genius in black children. Thank you, thank you, dear brother. Awakening the natural black genius, from Dr. Amos Wilson. The developmental child psychology. In fact, there's so few books and, and research have, that's been done on us in a very positive way. Uh, I went to the University of South Carolina, as I told you all, there was a professor named Marion Sims, who was a professor there, and uh, Professor Sims was considered the pioneer of gynecology and obstetrics. And this man was using enslaved Africans for years to, to do uh, surgery and practice on black women without their permission. And they had a women's dorm named Sims Dorm on the USC campus. So we, they have since removed that, and of course, a lot of it had to do with the activity with the uh, Black Lives Movement. But powerful books here. Uh, we've worked with Dr. Jawanza Kanjufo, Dr. Naeem Magbar. We've done national conferences, um, and we've been involved with the Me and Men March. Um, and what Brother Greg gave me was the Asafo book right here. And this is a powerful book. In fact, uh, Asafo is a... Uh, Ghanaian term, and Asafo means uh, it's a warrior group. It's like a manhood training group where you pull the boys aside for a period of time and you teach them what their duties and their obligations are. These are powerful, minimal, minimal work that if you're working with black boys, you should immerse yourself Minimally, if you're serious and you talk about you working with black boys, and the fact that we got 80% of the teachers in Charlemagne school system are white females. How in the hell are they going to teach black boys if they don't even have the most basic understanding of who they are? Not only, not only white females, but also we as black folk too, particularly that black ruling class. That black ruling class. So, guys, this is some minimal reading here and I uh, want to encourage you all, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free. Uh, at this point, we're gonna move on with the group activity. Yeah, just okay. a second. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. um, Brother Greg and Brother Jackson. Let's give it up for them. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to just shout out Greg. Uh, kudos to him because I love a young man who loves his mama. And oh, so uh, <laughs> that's what it's all about. Because uh, so many of us tend to stand in the gap at times for our young men, young men who may not have a father in the home and the mother is left to do both and try to put, do the best that she can Absolutely. to surround that young man with positive role models and influences so that he can recognize who he is and go out into this world and survive as best he can. And so I just wanna shout out all the mothers too who are doing that work yeah. um, and standing in the gap for young men. Um, as Greg and Reggie were speaking, uh, they really took me back uh, to my days when I worked at communities and schools. I got some good friends here um, who are there and, and continue to do that great work. Um, but when I started at Ranson Middle School, um, I specifically wanted to work at that school um, because I got tired of seeing on the news some of the things that they talked about um, that face our young men. I got tired of seeing on the news every time there's some gun violence or you know a carjacking or anything negative, who did they show a picture of? 
I got tired of that. I said, that's not who we are. That's not who they are. And so I want to do my part to go back and remind them who they were. Uh, similar to Greg, I lost a student as well um, to gun violence. And that hurts. You know, that hurts. Every time I see on the news where I know the young men are not, all these young men, particularly when it comes to police violence, gun violence, whatever it is, we're losing generations. And we cannot afford to do that any longer. We all have to step up to the plate and make sure that we do our part, our part, all of us, whether great or small, to ensure that they can live their God-given lives and fulfill their purposes on earth. And so that's why it's important for us today to be here discussing this topic and learning more about what we can do. Because again, as I stated, we're all a part of the same community. When one is hurt, we all are hurt. And so again, we're all in this together. So I'm thankful for the two of you today um, to be here. And before we break into a group exercise, I just have a few questions for you. I'm gonna start with you, Reggie. Um, the onset of this pandemic in 2020 caused all of us to have to reimagine what it looks like to be able to connect with others. Right. And I'm sure that mentorship as we know it was affected by that. Right. So could you please put into context for us, historically, what has mentorship meant and how can it look today and how does it look? Mm. Ashe, in, in fact, uh, most of our mentorship activities uh, in person, and it's important that we be in person too, just our spirit and the nature of us as a people, you know. Uh, so even with the raging pandemic epidemic going on, we continue to meet. We did various mitigations with masks, with the um, uh, proper um, cleaning materials, and, uh, and we met outside. So we were, uh, and you know, many of them did get vaccinated. Uh, I did, and because uh, I know what's required of me, I, I, I'm, I got a mission to work with this, with these families, and I can't take no stuff back home to my family. So you do, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, but um, so we continue to meet, and since uh, we would do fireside chats. We would have great discussions outside around a fire. I don't know if you all do that. Uh, I know you city folks don't do that, right? Okay, all right. But, but uh, so we would have these great discussions. We would do our, one of our major tenets, which is the agriculture. Uh, guys, producing the most beautiful, clean, unprocessed, unchemical, food you will ever see, mm. I'm telling you. And it was grown in the hands of these young black boys, these black boys who society s says is purveyors of violence, never did anything meaningful, they're lazy and weak and everything else. But we make damn fools out of them, we make liars out of them, I'm telling you. You wanna see positive, productive young men, you'll see them. We realize that because of the pandemic, guys, we just, we can't take no time off. We don't have the luxury of taking time off. While they may walk, we must run. This is uh, Judas Nere, former, former Tanzanian president. Guys, we just don't have the luxury of taking time off. I mean, we, we can't. I don't, know, I don't understand organizations who say, well, we meet once a week or once a month or, or uh, or we've shut down and have gone completely virtual. Now, we, we had to go virtual when it really started to rage. Um, and it did give us some type of um, insight into what was going on in the home sometimes too. Because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're watching and uh, some of the young people would, um, uh, would turn their cameras on and get missing or turn it off and get missing. Is that right, Cole? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, two of our young men right here. Uh, anyway, um, so we understood that we had to, uh, we use Zoom. We also communicate internally through, um, through GroupMe. And uh, 
just from a, a etymology standpoint, we use a lot of, uh, our language is a lot different internally too. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, we use um, the word uh, mashari. And one of the reasons why I do that is the, the origin of the word mentor itself. So mentor is a Greek word, and it deals with, and if you remember the Trojan War and Odyssey and all that, Odysseus uh, went to, uh, to the Trojan War, and he left his son in the care of mentor. And mentor did some things that he shouldn't have done. And one of the um, one of the thing, one of the issues that I think some quote mentorship organizations still suffer from is people are concerned about what are their intentions uh, and safety and security for their children. And I think we're we're still impacted, especially with organizations like uh, Big Brother, not Big Brothers, but uh, Boy Scouts and some of the others who've had all kinds of uh, sexual assault issues and. And that is a serious issue that we need to have discussions around. Because if someone says, well, I'm uncomfortable with my child or whatever, well, we got to deal with that. And so at the Mills Place, we do background checks. Uh, we study them hard. Uh, and we, uh, we, we uh, these Masharis, I got Brother Carlos here. I got uh, Mashari Carlos here. I got Mashari Von Il and Mashari AJ and Mashari. Carlton, we have Elder uh, Matthew Charity right here, and we have um, we have Elder um, Troy Allen. In fact, Troy is is, is going to accept a new position with us. It's going to be our academic advisor with us real soon. So, um, but we we deal with real stuff. We deal with it in a family way, in a family setting. But but to answer your question though. We cannot afford to take any time off. Again, this is survival, existential work that we're doing, and we just don't have the luxury of taking any time off, and, um, and we continue to engage. Thank you, thank mm -hmm. you, Reggie. Mm -hmm. As you all see, there's multiple ways um, and outlets that you can, can be a mentor and provide mentorship uh, to someone in need. And so my next question is for you, Greg. Um, and just let me say this, mentorship um, is important for, for all kids, no matter boys, girls, um, it's important. But for the purposes of this conversation today, we're centering the conversation around black men, black male youth, because they are at risk. They need our immediate attention. And so we're here today to learn about what, again, what can we do? And so my question to you is, why is it important for uh, youth, black youth, to have a mentor who they can identify with um, to help them receive positive outcomes? <laughs> so seeing is believing. If they don't know it can be accomplished, how will they even accomplish? Um, the kids that we work with all the time, I make sure that they see my success. I make sure that they understand that success is possible against all odds. Um, in our after school program right now in CMS, uh, in Martin Luther King Middle School, uh, self-efficacy is very low right now. So low that CMS has altered some of their curriculum to enter self-efficacy. Self-efficacy. Our children do not believe they can get themselves out of the situations that they are in problem. They do not believe. Scary to not have hope, to not have faith, to not believe that you can get out of the situation that you're in. So we're focused on building self-efficacy, giving them projects that brings confidence to them so they know that they can walk out into the world with power, the power does not come from this westernized society and what they define it as. The power comes from what is instilled in you and who is around you. And if I empower you, then you will be empowered. So our children walk around with their chest out after a couple of weeks, with their heads up after a couple of weeks. 
we just started a merchandise program where our children had designed their own logo for Stop the Violence. You'll be seeing a scan, a QR code, so you can scan and see the, see the merchandise yourselves. But what did this do? This gave them belief that they could design something from scratch and create something that can live past them. They can accumulate and build their own revenue without leaning on an institution that is racist, an institution that does not care about them at all. Not their college education, not their high school education, really don't care if you can read at a fourth grade reading level. So we instill all these values of integrity, doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Because in this society, you gotta hold yourself accountable. You gotta have some integrity, because the opposition will tempt you and try to strip you of your integrity. We focus on passion, hone in on them and learn what you're passionate about. Most of our children have about seven to 10 passions. I let them know one of those passions is gonna walk you into your divine purpose. If you focus and have integrity, with your passion, you will walk into your purpose. And then we focus on legacy. Learning about what legacy is. And not having to build your own legacy, but attaching yourself to a legacy that pre-exists. Attaching yourself to the legacy of African people. Attach yourself to the legacy of Christ. Attach yourself to something that is bigger than you, and then walk in it, and carry a torch, and carry a torch in pride. We don't do mentorship from a westernized, colonized place. That means you have a clock out button, like Brother Reggie was talking about. There is no clock in and clock out to building a village. I come from a place where the auntie down the block can grab me by my neck and say, go back home. It didn't matter what time. That's because we still had some of our values. That's because our elders weren't scared of us. Our elders had time for us, 24-7. 365, you stand on that corner if you want to. So mentorship for me is all day. It takes a village to raise a village. I am who I am because we are. That is all day. The problem with mentorship is we have adapted this westernized way of doing it and we have monopolized it. It's a money thing. But this is who we naturally are. We naturally take care of each other. We naturally do life together. We do this journey together on purpose. We are intentional. We are consistent. Kobe Bryant said the best ability is availability. Are you available for these black boys? Can you not be tired? And if you don't see the representation that is up here, brother, brother Reggie, Baba Reggie is my elder. I am next. And I am training what is next after me. Legacy. Legacy. Where is our legacy? What legacy will these young boys attach themselves to if we don't bring them a legacy? They know no legacy. Some of their legacies is my daddy is in jail. My mama is on drugs. I have been homeless for four years. I've been staying in a hotel. That's what some of the legacy is. The devil is a lie. So we make sure that they don't see 
what the media gives them. We create our own media. Mentorship now in 2023 means you mentor on social media. You become responsible with what you post, with who you follow, with who your kids follow. I was watching a story on 60 Minutes where it said the Asian version of Instagram, of TikTok, is heavily restricted. Their kids have restrictions on who they can follow, what time they can follow, what they are watching. You know what they follow? Astronauts, teachers, lawyers, doctors. That's who they are forced to follow. Because our Asian brothers and sisters have realized we can't just mentor and then leave. Because they're on a device all day. Why do we let our children be unsupervised on a device? I am with them for three hours a day. They are with the device for the other six, 18, 21 hours. I need help. I need you to not be afraid of your children. I need you not to be focused on being they got darn friend. We're in a sensitive time where everybody's vulnerable and everybody got emotions and everybody wants to speak their mind. But a child must stay in a child's place. An adult must be an adult. That's mentorship. I'm not here to introduce you to the world. I'm here to introduce you to what the world is supposed to be. 24, seven, 365, because they're watching us. Be careful with what you post, with what you listen to in front of your children, what you watch in front of your children because you are mentoring them before I am. All right, thank you, Brother Greg. Brother Greg preaching up in here today, y'all. I'm right now. I'm here. But speaking all truth, all truth. Um, quickly, before we move into our small group sessions, one or both, if you could answer the question for those who want to know, okay, I'm ready. What do I need to do? Is there any training? What other requirements do I need to meet in order to be a mentor? Okay. Uh, Sister Nora is in the corner over here. She is a uh, great friend of ours, great partner, longtime friend, along with the intern right there. They partner with the male's place. Uh, they, uh, so Females serve and play a very important role in the socialization process for males too. We're not, we don't exclude females or anything like that, even though the men do most of the direct work. But um, in terms of advising, uh, helping with st strategy and technique and um, with evaluations and everything like that, as well as just being, again, a, an advisor on, on a number of different things. It's, it's a very important role. Um, our organization, it's necessary that organizations like this one be around. And if you value black boys, that's what this is about. If you value black boys, not just, oh, I like black boys, or just like us on Facebook, but value. And this is where you put your money and your time into things that you value. The Bible says where a man's heart is, what? So too is his treasure, right? Amen. Yes. So you can't say, well, you value black boys and then the government got to do it or we're going to wait until the corporations give the damn money. You got to value enough, whereas 
we decide this is greatly important to us and we're going to invest our time and our money into it. So um, this couple right here, the, the Allen family, they've, they've been with us from um, uh, huh? around July. These folks came in and said, and, and they're invested in us with, as a family. They didn't come in and say, gimme, gimme, gimme. They'll come in and say, how can we help? How can we give? They give their hard-earned con earned time, they give resources, and they give money. This elder right here, Matthew Charity, right here. Raise your hand, elder. Uh, met him about 25 years ago uh, when his grandson's mother was a child. About 25 years ago, we were doing a father and daughter dinner and dance that I coordinated uh, out at the Merchandise Mart a long time ago. I didn't have all this great stuff back then. But I met him, and uh, he reconnected with us, and this guy comes and gives his time. He just pours into the organization uh, with his time, with his um, patience, his money, and uh, you got Sister Nikki Boyd back there, uh, who has, uh, who's on our board of directors, and give her time and and, 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 and commitment and, a, and, and truly advocate for the organization. Again, uh, we have Mashari Von Il, you know, who works incessantly. You know, Mashari De Carlos works incessantly, okay? I wanna thank all of you. So what do we need? If this is the question, what do we need? Um, and, and the first thing that comes out of people's mouth is money. I mean, money would enhance what we're doing, but don't think for one minute if you just give us money, because we're not prostitutes at all. We're not, go, we're not, we're not gonna be no prostitutes. We ain't bending over for nobody. All right? Nobody going in on us. And we ain't putting no dress on. That's what they do in Hollywood, right? That's what they tell you, right? Yeah, we ain't putting no dress on. But, uh, <clears throat> Now, we don't, we don't discriminate against anybody either. But um, so, of course, money's always important, particularly when it comes to endowment, because I'm thinking big picture. How does the Males Place and other organizations that are serious continue to be sufficient and to continue to be sustainable for children that even yet to be born? Because we've been around since 93, but we must be sustainable. And so endowments, okay? Endowments where we're able to ensure that our, a lot of our children are able to go to trade school, to go to um, college, uh, to join the workforce, to learn the trades, okay? To learn to work with their hands. And other things that we need would be arable land. Guys, so we grow and have mastered agriculture through the works and the teachings and studies of Dr. George Washington Carver, the preeminent scientist. This guy literally saved America from itself. These people were planting cotton. I know you all don't know what cotton is, but this guy was, they were planting cotton on every square foot of this South in particular. Cotton, uh, cotton and corn are two of those things that deplete the soil so badly. But they were, because it was so profitable. The South was making money, even for those of you from New York and all this other stuff from up north, you, you all made a lot of money from the processing of, the, uh, of cotton as well, shipping it all over the globe. So we grow some cotton too. We grow cotton. We grow indigo, we grow uh, Carolina gold rice. We teach our young boys um, the cash crops and how really America um, explains a lot of how America created this wealth gap in addition to just exploiting our bodies for free. But they made millions and billions of dollars that they still benefit from even to this day from these uh, cash crops. So, uh, so we need arable land. 
that not only where we are able to use for teaching purposes, but where we also can do for commercial purposes. You all are complaining about right now about what? I mean, you all are complaining about what being so expensive right now, you're just frustrated. Eggs, okay? So where do you get your eggs from? Food line and all these other places. Why shouldn't you, why shouldn't you, if you need eggs, and we like eggs, why shouldn't you buy the eggs from black boys? How many of you like collard greens? Uh, well, this looks like a kale crowd here, by the way. <laughs> Sister Kim in the back, okay, all right. Sister Shelley, this kale group, okay. Uh, so, so why shouldn't you buy your collard greens from, from the male's place? Guys, we had a collard green, our annual collard green sale recently, and uh, I, one of my mothers told me that one of the persons told them that um, the male's place collard greens is seven dollars. Uh, how big are the leaves? <laughs> Brother Kelly, she said, I can go to Food Line and get a bundle of kale for two dollars. But I, but I told him, I said, well, Food Line is not invested in the, into liberating and saving your sons. It's a fundraiser for us. So. So again, we need arable land so we can grow more, produce more. This is what a people do all the time. They chart out how we're going to ensure the health, the education, the, uh, how we're going to feed people. This is what serious leaders do all over the world. And we've got to chart that out. So arable land, we need uh, uh, an endowment. We need um, mechanization for that because if we get the arable land, we're going to need these combines and tractors and everything else. Now, these young men right here, they be in there with their hoes and their rakes and they're doing all the weeding and all that. But if we're talking acres upon acres, we're going to need tractors and other equipment. Now, that with all this technology, they might be able to do a lot of it with their what? Cell phones now, right? Because they love them cell phones. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so those are some needs that we have right now. Arable land. Uh, financial assistance with the endowment and um, mechanization. Um, we could always use technology and equipment. Of course, we saw during the pandemic the, uh, the divide with not a lot of us having access to, um, to, yes. uh, to IT equipment and stuff like that. We could use help with tutoring. Okay, any of you with special tutoring? Uh, or if any of you just want to come out in our garden and pull some weeds and interact and engage with our young people. Okay? Ashe? Ashe. All right. Thank you. And I'll, I'll jump in there real quick. Uh, um, and we have similarities on the need. Um, first, I need you to understand that God is ready to use you where you are. So many people like to wait until everything's perfect or you got that perfect amount of time and I set this aside. Let God use you now and just be amazed about what he does through you. Be uncomfortable. I need you to be uncomfortable and be cool and comfortable with being uncomfortable because mentorship is uncomfortable. Number two, I need you to have a servant's heart. I need you to have a servant's heart. Be comfortable with being uncomfortable and have a servant's heart. That thing don't turn off. Servant heart to have you pay in somebody's hotel room when you think you were supposed to be watching football. Okay? I need you to have a servant heart. And number three. This is so important. I need you to help us build a revenue stream that is sustainable because we cannot depend on institutions that was built on racism to help us get out of the situations that we're in. I need you to help us build a revenue stream, black people that we own. At Hill Charlotte, we do that through our merchandise. 
That's how we raise our funds. Through our merchandise. There will be other ways for us to do it, but when you see the male's place growing the food and they saying, come buy it, go buy it. Go buy it. When you see Hill Charlotte with the merchandise and we say we need you to buy it, go buy it. Or else you cannot complain that an institution gave us $25,000 out of a $100 million budget. You cannot complain and go to them and say, why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? Well, why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? Be uncomfortable. Have a servant's heart. And help the organization build a revenue stream that is sustainable. So we do not have to lean on institutions that were built on racism. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Patrick Stepp. I am the programs manager for the Levine Museum of the New South. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, we do want to move on to our small group sessions now. One of the things we are very excited about this program that we are presenting today is not only to listen to the fantastic words from our experts and community leaders, but we also want to hear from the people who are here with us, who are a part of the actual community. So we have some questions for you that we are going to distribute out. And if you can just find some groups, I'm gonna give them to each row, um, one notepad with the list of questions. And we're gonna take about 15 to 20 minutes for everyone here to have discussions with your neighbors, um, with the people in your row, the people around you, and discuss uh, what these questions may bring up in your mind, find the answers. Uh, if we can have one person maybe take some notes that might volunteer to share with us later. So we're gonna take about 15 minutes to, to answer these questions you see right here. Um, there are a lot of them, so don't try to answer them all. Maybe pick your favorites. And then we're going to share out so we all can have a discussion about these questions and, of course, um, be led by our, our experts here. So thank you so much, and we will give those questions to you right now. I think, I think with showing these works at the Gantt Center, I'm able to speak on the topics that I speak to in all my work but I'm able to really like hammer it in. I think if painting is going to matter and it's not just going to be an adornment or just another pretty object that's being brought into the world, then I think painting needs to be tied to something. You know, I think it's very important to not escape these things, right? I think it's, it's, it's important to confront these feelings, these notions, these ideals. And so I try and harness that pain, harness those emotions on that topic and relate that through picture making. These paintings are tied to spirituality, they're tied to history, and they're, they're tied to something that's also deeply personal for him, you know, and his family. I started as a graphic designer but at the same time, I had a very strong hand. I was um, a really good illustrator. So when I was thinking about stepping outside of graphic design, I felt like painting made the most sense. Yeah, growing up, I mean, my father always said, Any, in anything that you do, you should honor God, right? As I was becoming an adult and my own man, that time frame, with also the time of me maturing and becoming a maker, those timelines are very, um, they're very connected. You know, abstract painting for me, it, it lies in energy. It lies in the moment. But at the same time, I guess as I mature as a painter too, you know, concepts do come to mind. So it's about marriaging those two sides, right? Having a, a distinct idea of something to make or a concept on how to approach a, a picture. But at the same time, leaving that room for abstraction to happen, right? Where it's just fluidity and flow and energy. I describe Reginald Sylvester's um, art style as abstract expressionism, but also action painting. I also consider him to be a mixed media artist who's not only doing painting, but is also working in assemblage, also working to some extent quite sculpturally. 
And so when I think about making these abstract pictures, again, they're from my own experiences, things that I go to, but there also is mes messages lined through these works. You know, I think that he's also part of a, a long lineage of abstract painters, both black and, 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 and non-black painters as well. And I think his work fits very well in that, in that conversation and in that lineage. When I think about, as far as like an abstract painter, right, one who's dedicated themselves to their practice and their work, someone like William de Kooning comes to mind. Someone like Frank Bowling comes to mind. It's a combination of different artists that I look at, but again, not just the art that they make or the work that they make, but more so the careers that they've had. Reginald Sylvester is an artist that I have a, like a great deal of, of, of belief in his, his trajectory and his future um, as an artist. And when I was thinking about bringing an exhibition of his work to the Gantt Center, it just really dawned on me that this was like the, it was the perfect moment for both the Gantt Center and for Reginald Sylvester because you have an artist who I think is on the cusp of just a tremendous career ahead of him. And you have an institution that is reaching this milestone that I think is, is an indicator of its future as well, that it has a great future ahead of it. And to bring those two things together, to be a curator that can kind of make those, those two things happen, it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. Having a solo museum show is a big deal, but I think having a solo museum exhibition in, in the state where you were born, where your family members get to come and see your work displayed in a museum, that's so special. You know, I want this to be a show where, you know, black and brown and indigenous folks can come and really feel, you know, what we've been going through. You know, so what better place to do it than to be at the Harvey B. Gantt Center? I'm here to celebrate the opening of Men of Change, Power, Triumph, Truth. This exhibit is a celebration of black excellence, of the ability to overcome adversity and the gifts that our elders have provided for our children. This extraordinary exhibit invites us to look at American culture through the stories of 27 iconic African-American men who have changed the world. Philosophers and writers spanning generations from W.E.B. Du Bois to the James Baldwin Stokely Carmichael, Tanisha Coates, Bob Moses, musicians spanning from Duke Ellington to Kendrick Lamar, filmmakers like Ryan Kogler who brought Wakanda to life. All of these men who stood with their heads held high, who understand that even today it is a time and a season for men of courage. And also, this exhibition helped to shine light on local black men that are making a difference in their community. So we want to make sure we help introduce them to the community and thank them for the great work they're doing as they too are men of change in our hometown. Have spaces in both museums with your men of change to tell your own story, to also put those stories to front, to share that. That is how we grow as a community. And so it is important for the best of the best to be on exhibit because these men are examples that we want our children to emulate. That's what this exhibition means. It means pride. It means understanding the shoulders we stand on and looking forward to a better tomorrow.
Okay, was that a good conversation? Everybody had a good conversation? Yeah, clap it up for yourselves. Clap it up for yourselves. Clap it up for yourselves. Excuse me, queen. These questions are good. These questions was good. I think, I think, I think Baba Reggie, these are your questions, right? Huh? Were these your questions? I, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did submit five. Okay. Ago! 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 I say, I say. All right, thank you all for your undivided. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Let's do it one more time. One more. Ago! Ago! Right. And, and the way we, that's a call and response that we use. And when we went to Ghana back in 2010, that was something that we brought back. And one of the reasons, so ago means, may I have your attention? Mm. Ago. So the elder, before he speaks, would say, ago. And the young uh, children or everyone would say, ame. So they would turn their full attention to the elder and would say, Ame, I am ready to listen, ready to learn. When I was in Charleston, we used to, the kids were all over the place, jumping up and down. We said, boy, sit down, shut up, be quiet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but this is much more effective, and I'm telling you, uh, our, our full team uses it, and you want to see disciplined black boys. Yeah and responding to the elders, yeah. just try that. That's and much better than, if you can hear me, clap once. Right. I, I All right. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and start to process those questions, right? Uh, let's go with the different groups. Uh, what group you, you want to start, Elder? Group one. What group are you in? Okay. Oh, no numbers? Okay. No numbers or anything? All right. Are you, the, um, are you leading? I am. You look like a leader. Okay, all right. I am. All right, look like you running things. things, okay. Please, thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, so I guess we'll be the official oh, group really? one. Um, cheers to my group, hello to my group. Oh, yeah. um, and one of the questions that I, we really um, touched in depth on was uh, question six, which reads, what are some of the biggest challenges that black male youth face and must overcome? And the part two to that was, how might a mentor help um, these youth navigate those challenges. Um, so what I did was I um, basically jotted down a lot of the notes, a lot of the key points that my group touched on. Um, one of the first ones was media tax portrayal and the narrative of how black boys are seen, whether that's on social media, whether that's on television, um, that's really important. If all that children are seeing are our black male and our black leaders being locked up, um, the way that we look after um, in our mug shots and things of that nature, that's all that they see, that's all that they're going to know. That's right. um, we definitely need leaders such as you two, um, definitely impacting our community and showing what it means to be um, a black leader and what it means to have a positive image instead of the negative images that they try to portray us to be. Um, with that, we also mentioned the perception of being violent. When black males are seen, they are naturally seen as being violent and aggressive, when naturally that is not who we are. Um, that is who they, that is what they portray us to be. Um, we also mentioned lack of belonging, um, learning how to um, learn conflict resolution, what it means to de-escalate situations, um, and then how to be a man and what it means to be a role model. Those are all things that we need um, in order to have proper mentorship and to raise the black youth. And then um, to the part two of that question, which mainly uh, discussed what, it, what a mentor needed to look like, um, the first thing we mentioned was uh, serve as the role model, be the role model, be the person um, that you want these young men to be at when they grow up. Teach them what to do and what not to do through what you have learned. Mm -hmm. um, going back to Ubuntu, I am because we are um, really reaching back to that youth and giving them what, what they need to learn, the tools and the resources necessary that they are leaders um, similarly to what we are leading growing up when they grow up. Um, seeing an example, um, being consistent, advocating constantly, always advocating for our black male youth is important because if we don't advocate for them, nobody else will. 
So it's really important that we are always be advocating and being there for um, our youth. And then similarly, something that I um, wrote down that really just kind of approaches what it means to be a mentor and what it means to develop the youth. Um, in my alma mater, Spelman College, we have a saying that says, be the change that you want to see in the world. We all need to aspire to be the change that we need to see, that we would like to see in the world. And lastly, um, the exposure. Um, I believe it was you who discussed, or um, my one of my other teammates who discussed, um, exposing our kids to um, different things. Exposure leads to expansion. How do they know what what's out there in the world if we don't expose them to what's out there in the world? Um, and lastly, one of the things that we discussed was how to problem solve, giving the correct tools to problem solve before it gets into conflict. Um, and yeah. That Love that. Yeah. Love that. I like what she was talking about when she said um, belonging, because uh, we didn't get to talk about alienation and how young black boys don't feel like they're a part of this society at all, and they're alienated from this world. Um, and then problem solving. We don't teach our kids how to critically think anymore, you know, telling them to figure it out, you know? Uh, Reggie, you gonna say something? I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to commend a young sister here and, uh, and salute your parents, too. That's, that's, okay, all right, all right, all right. Wonderful job. Wonderful job, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what's the, going to go to the next group? Yeah. yeah, next group. Who wants to step up? Don't be shy. If you need, yes. Come on. Come on up here. Do your presentation. Brother Kale, are you with them? Are you with them, Brother Kale? Okay. All right. This is the Bushy group here, y'all. Come on. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 All right, so for our group, we did number three, what you think of Dr. King's three triplets of evils in our society, racism, materialism, and militarism. Actually, uh, I talked about the militarism, and I was just talking about how the, the streets is really militarized, but we're fighting over something that really has no cause, fighting over blocks that we don't own, um, fighting over who can get the most money where off of selling product that kills our people. Uh, and that right there is something that happens back basically out of fear because you've got two different, two different types of dudes being raised up in the same community, and that community has a whole lot of things going on in it. And regardless of whether you got somebody that's raised in a church home or somebody that's just raised by a street family, they're still going into that same community. So the gangs is actually preying off of the fear of both of them, really in order to militarize our youth. And so what we have to do is really counteract that because a lot of the stuff that goes in the ear gate and into the eye gate is something that actually promotes that fear. Instead of promoting that fear, we gotta promote positive mental attitude, positive self-image, and actually the ability to stand up for self. Let's go, Ira. there's a conflict or if there's an issue that's going on, hence 2016 what went on, how are we getting to these neighborhoods and why are the highways in certain neighborhoods that allow access to get in in terms of if something happens and we need to conduct martial law, it's all in the neighborhoods of color. So that was set up for a specific reason. If you look around the whole city of Charlotte, in addition to this, when we start talking about, um, where we at? Okay, yeah, so um, we talk materialism and racism. Uh, when you talk implicit and complicit racism, it's exactly what you was talking about. It's speaking about putting one against another instead of connecting us together and helping us to understand that we're not just operating out of fear and just operating out of the materialistic things that exist in our society. But we are seeing, like the young lady said, uh, reimagining what the possibilities are, and that's where we get together and operate from a space of love, and that's how we make change. And to Greg's point, when we talk to our young people, they want to do right. They're ready to do right. 
but oftentimes that piece right there allows them to only see the negative stuff that's placed on television that's on, let's go back a second, because television is called programming. Mm -hmm. It's called programming for a reason, because it programs people to think one way, but the exposure, hence seeing the things that we don't imagine, puts us down the path for a journey onto our healing. And if we keep focusing on the trauma, hence trauma-informed care, hence operating from a space of trauma, that keeps us in a space of survival when we should be in a place of thriving. So our communities, when we operate from that space, that's what transforms us and put them in a place of excellence where they're supposed to be. All right, and I'll let it come behind, yeah. behind Kelly with what he said about um, the, the programming. It's important for us to instill a variety of different images of our children. And I said us. Yes. It's not for us to rely on other people to do it. Mm -hmm. When we see our race, in a monolithic fashion, we're doing ourselves a disjustice. When you see people who speak proper grammar and you say that's talking white, what message does that send to kids? When you see students that are getting straight A's and you say that is people who are trying to be white, what message are you sending? We have to change the narrative that we are sending to our own kids. Because guess what? When you're telling them all that stuff, mm -hmm. they get trapped. Yeah. They decide they want to dumb down. Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes it easy for teachers to reinforce what they really think about us. Mm -hmm. And if your child decides they want to go to college, by the time they get there, it may not be an option to go the direct way if that's what they want to do. That brings up another thing, presenting options. You don't have to go to college if you don't want to. Yes. There are other options out here. Yes, it's important for our community to present the options to the kids. Mm -hmm. If you want to be an entrepreneur, let's set it up. Mm -hmm. Credit, financial literacy, all this stuff that people are dealing with because we fail to instill it into them, the time is now for us to change that. We have to do that. We need to stop relying on everybody else to do it and blaming everybody else and parents need to partner with the educators. I have worked in CMS. Amen. I was a substitute teacher. I was a teacher assistant. I was one of the ones who did the extra stuff from little to no pay to ensure that kids that were behind grade level could soar. When I had teachers, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody, that's the show. All right. <laughs> but this, nah, it's, don't you apologize for your passion for what you feel for our community, because that's the type of passion that we need to have 24 7. Right. Amen. So we got about, I let think, me, seven minutes. Let me, um, let me, let me go ahead. A, let me, particularly in light of the great question regarding the three evils of our society. And I'm thinking, regardless of where our politics are, we, we speak of how there is the food insecurity, the job insecurity, the housing insecurity, and all this other stuff, as well as the crime and everything else. But the hundreds of billions of dollars that we've <laughs> exported to Ukraine Guys, and we got our own issues here yeah, as right. fellow American citizens who've never, ever had our issues adequately addressed, <laughs> let alone uh, receive any meaningful repair of the damage that's been inflicted upon us. Amen. So just, again, we can, we can talk about healing and all that other stuff, but again, think of the hundreds of Billions of dollars that we've just dropped on a, you know, on, on Ukraine. And again, you know, is that war necessary? I mean, think about what we spend with the U.S. war, every, I mean, the military every day. So, 
Uh, yes. Just a thought, just to drive it home a little further. That's that's it. Yes. So so we going I think we're gonna close in a little while. Um, okay. She everybody's said, she passionate. Said, she everybody's said you ain't ready. Go home. Hey, well, you ain't gotta go home, but uh, <laughs> you know. But I do want everybody to leave like encouraged. Like we talked about a lot of the issues, a lot of the things that exist. Um, that are stopping us, a lot of the walls and the barriers that are put against us as African-American people here in this country. But there's hope. There's hope in everybody that is inside of this room. There's hope that's in everybody that's in this city. We just need you to activate yourself. Put yourself into action mode. Not complaining mode, but solution mode. We are solutionists. That's who we are. We figure things out. And we have to do that as a village. And with that, Baba Reggie, how do we close? Well, I, I want to do one final question. We'll close with a harambe. But uh, last question here is, we talked about, the initial question was, what have you done? But I want to, if you, we all would just go around and provide us with one, what will you do? as it relates to the development and the liberation of black boys. What will you do, each of you? Okay. Uh, we'll start with Sister Boy. Okay. In fact, you could all stand up. You want to pass the mic? I do better when I stand ready. Yes, ma'am. Because I'm so tall. Okay. You are. You are. Um, I did share with Reggie that I'm going to make a personal donation from now on to the mail's place. And uh, at the corporate level, I'm going to go back to my church and make sure that my church continues a good relationship with mail's place. CNG. We've made mm -hmm. contributions 10 years ago for you all to go to Ghana. I think we did it twice. You did? That's right. And we also donated a van, ministry van for them. So. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility to make sure we carry on Asha. that work. Thank you, Sister Boyd. Mom. Yes. Um, good evening, brothers and sisters. God bless you all. I will continue the um, works of my ancestors, my parents, my mother, Paula Bailey, Akram Ukda, and I will die empty. I will die empty in works. I'm not going to die with a... Uh, with they say half empty, half full. Mm -hmm. No, my works will be done, and I will do them till I die. And yes. that has been to encourage our black men, um, m the village, New York, Baltimore, here now, Charlotte. Um, I'm an auntie. Everybody call me auntie, yes, auntie, auntie. And I will continue to be an auntie to everyone's children, and they don't scare me. So. This generation, these millennials do not scare me. Mm. So I let them know, hey, hey, hey. And they're like, oh, auntie. So I will continue to feed, nourish, check, correct, all right. <laughs> and all those things for the betterment of our people. Because we're great people and they're great. And I will die letting them know how great they are and how much they are needed. God bless. Okay. Let's be um, let's be succinct. <laughs> succinct. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Um, so I've spent the past 20 years um, uh, building the liberation of our children and nation building. So I'm going to continue that work through Hill Charlotte, and I'm going to bring my son to you and hope that you know I'm able to also um, participate in the work that you're doing as well. So. Thank you, sister. What's going on, everybody? How y'all doing? Hey, what's up? Uh, I am Travis P. Jackson. And the way that I will continue to empower young men is through my work that I've done with uh, HBC Pride Nation. I have a company that promotes black colleges and high schools and across the country. So I help students get into HBCUs as well as I am a mentor and a uh, impactful person in Charlotte. So, yeah. Thank you, Travis. I'm gonna just continue to work with uh, Baba Reggie Singleton in, in the Mighty Males Place and continue to mentor and groom young males to men. I'm gonna continue doing the work that I'm doing. My name is Ira uh, Lawrence. I'm 
defunct 57 ministries, and we also divert you from the school to prison pipeline and help guys that are returning home from prison to return with dignity. And so we're going to continue to do that. Kelly Little, uh, the Urban Institute for Strengthening Families. I will continue to work alongside my comrades up front, as well as partner with other organizations in the community for the uplift of our people, making sure we get them exposed to every experience that they never thought was possible so that they can do the impossible. <laughs> I'm Janelle Perry, and I, um, as I am re-entering into my um, activism um, after taking care of my grandfather for a little bit, I am going to continue to mentor my nephew, and I am also going to be working on executing my affordable housing um, RFP, and it is affordable housing with a guarding on top as well as six different goals that the residents of the affordable housing um, community will be partnering with organizations within Mecklenburg County or wherever it's replicated to be able to provide upward mobility from them so that it's more like transitional housing and we partner with them for what they want to do in the community. Hello, my name is Navolia and I am not a guest here, although I feel like it sometimes because I'm a newcomer to Charlotte. However, um, this program or this uh, what we are doing today is so inspiring to me. Knowing uh, that I was in the generation with King, uh, Dr. King, uh, yes, okay, I'm gonna try to take my time. But I'm so glad that the fire is not out of me, even at my age, that I can still feel that I want to honor this man because he was in my time and I was in his time. And I'm so happy to see all the young people continuing to do the work because that's what it's about. It's called work. Mm -hmm. But as long as you have the energy, and I said to this young man right here, the spirit, because the spirit never dies. Yes. It will never die. Mm -hmm. You mentors who are mentoring, don't you ever let them see no hope in your eyes when you're talking to them. Let them see and feel the hope so you can continue to have a gathering like this for years to come. Because it's about the ones that we don't have any knowledge of, the generations to come. I'm just so happy that my spirit led me here today. Sometimes when you get older, you feel like, oh, I don't feel like doing this. But every year I've done this until COVID. And even when I lived in Washington, Maryland, slash, I took my grandchildren to events so they could understand what had happened. So you are standing on the shoulders of a lot, a lot of people who've gotten you here and you've gone to honor them. Maybe I don't have the energy or the time to come out like I would like to do, I'm kind of jealous of these young people who are still saying, I'm doing this and I'm doing that because I used to do that. <laughs> but I'm so happy today that I followed my spirit and came because this has uplifted me so much to see this work is going to be continued forever and ever. Yes. Amen. 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 Well, I'm so glad that uh, I came here today because it was really inspiring to see these two mentors up here, these gentlemen, uh, talk about what they're doing for the community and for uh, the black men, uh, well, the black boys who are going to become men. And uh, I have uh, been thinking of how I can be some help to either one of you guys. So I'll speak with you after this service. All right, after this session, I should say. Love service. <laughs> uh, 
Troy Allen, and um, as a father of three young black men, 22, 18, and, and, and well, 15, 19, and 23, I gotta add a year to it. Um, I've, uh, I've had the wonderful experience of, of raising black men. And my, my commitment, not only to the Charlotte community, is to ensure that my sons understand that they have a responsibility to this community. Um, and I'm gonna continue, the Allen family will continue our work with the, the Mayo's Place, the work that you're doing, Baba Reggie. We're gonna continue to give our time, our resources, and we wanna find additional ways from, from as it relates to the sustainable, things we kinda talked about and you mentioned, find creative ways to kinda make that happen. <laughs> oh, there's so many positive things. Um, as a parent of a 31-year-old and a 14-year-old and a 13-year-old male, um, at the last minute, we found out about the information concerning the workshop, and I wanted to come because I wanted to find out more about it, but then I also wanted to empower males that I know that are mentorships by spirit, and that's what, I, what Cord with me, he's one of my employees. So I wanted to, because I have a group of males that I know that they could benefit from being mentors and then th that you could benefit from them being mentors as well and they'll have a way to give back. Um, so my company and I want to participate and commit to monthly installments to your organization to making sure that, so we wanna link up with the company and we wanna be able to even mentor any children that are in need, whatever it is that the male place needs, we wanna be able to partnership. And then also we wanna work toward with other organizations and helping fathers become employed. Um, because you have boys that have male images, but they need to be able to look up to other males, their fathers. So we just wanna just partner up with the whole situation, period. Um, in a whole, in any way possible, we want to sit down and see what is it that we can do. So instead of doing what we want to do, we want you to tell us what is it that we need to do and how we can assist in any way possible. Thank you. Y'all, I know this conversation could go on and on, um, but I'll let y'all do it. I'll let you do it. Yeah, at the end. Um, but you know, we have to be respectful of our partners because uh, they allowed us to use this space <laughs> to the Harvey Gantt Center. Thank you again. Um, and who knows, you know, perhaps we can keep this conversation going. Perhaps we can have a part two because I would love to hear about what each and every one of us has been able to do after being inspired here today and stay connected. And so thank you from the Levine Museum of the New South from the Harvey B. Gantt Center. Uh, for taking your time and spending it with us today to learn more about what we all can do to support black male youth. And please continue um, to stay connected with us. If you have not seen the Men of Change exhibit yet, please do. It's between us and the Levine Center. We have half, I mean, and the Gantt Center, and they have half. So please visit it. Please encourage others to come out and learn more and see the positive images and influence of black men. And with that, I will turn it over to our facilitators cl to close out. Thank you all again for coming, and you have a great day, great week, and let's stay inspired. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sister Karen, for coordinating all of this and putting it together. Also, uh, want to thank Brother Greg for partnering with me, too, and thank each of you for coming out. I hope that you all are inspired and encouraged. And most importantly, we'll leave here and we'll seize the moment. Dr. King said, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? So let's, we gotta get to work. What I'd like to do is to close out with a little energy. Uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who used to be the president of Kenya, used to always open and close a lot of his meetings with Harambe and harambe. So harambe means to work together, to pull together. It's kind of like our hands are all, you got the individual hand, fingers, but when you pull that bad boy together and you go harambe, harambe. And on the seventh one, you hold it and yelling at the top of your lungs until the fire marshal comes. Okay? <laughs> so, yes, sir. Okay. Here you go, sir. Here you go. Here you go, young brother. Thank you, sir. Yes, 
stated that what are your thoughts about the African proverb when a boy is not initiated into the village, he will burn it to the ground merely to flee. And my thought there was the lack of love and loyalty ult ultimately results in destruction. Love and loyalty translates to unity. A cry for love, relate. Yeah, in, in fact, we're literally seeing the village burn right around us because these boys are so angry and enraged that we've failed them. And so they're angry as, and so they're literally burning the village down around us. So it's, the, the question was, uh, or the proverb says that when a boy is not initiated into the village, he'll literally burn the village to the ground merely to feel its warmth. That speaks to necessity of your manhood training, your rites of passage, where, again, everybody was socialized. The males and the females was pulled aside for a period of time, and they were taught, uh, you are a Sutton family member, and here's what Suttons do. Here's the expectations of a Sutton. Uh, you don't use profanity. You don't use tobacco. You don't use alcohol, or what, whatever. You, uh, you are upright people, you value education, you're decent uh, people. And so this is what our ancestors did, and, and that's what that meant. Thank you, dear brother. Thank you. So what we're going to do is everybody would stand. We're going to do a Harambe chant, and uh, if you all would raise your hand. Everybody, raise your hand. Just extend it like this, and we're going to go Harambe like this. We're going to do it seven times, okay? All right? And, and if you all can give me your... Uh, your Barry White voices, everybody. Arumbi. Arumbi. Okay, can y'all do it like that? Yes. All right. Can you do can you give me a Barry White voice, sis, sis boy? There you go, there you go, there you go. Okay, everybody ready? Harumbi! 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 Harumbi!